the Tiger Beetle sessions, Friday, 10th December, session one. Hey, Isaac, what's up? Hey, Yoren. Last time we were on Zig Showtime, we had nearly finished our view stamp replication consensus algorithm implementation. This is for our financial database, Tiger Beetle. However, there's one large missing piece here. The ViewStamp replication implementation has storage persistence to a VSR log. This, this means that incoming data and requests get stored in a, a simple um, ring buffer on disk. However, this log wraps around after some time. And for a true database, we need a longer term storage solution that, that can handle much more data. And so we have started to work on a log structured merge tree implementation. Um, you want to explain why we need to roll this in-house yarn instead of using some ready-made solutions such as LevelDB or RocksDB? Yeah, you mean you're smelling a little bit of NIH uh, <laughs> in, in our in our <laughs> <century> Maybe <laughs> just a little bit, since this is a very large undertaking. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty big. Um, I think like working on this LSM storage is probably like ten times more scary than doing consensus. Uh, <laughs> it's uh, yeah. Um, so yeah, so we basically, like Isaac said, we've yeah, we we've you know we've got the we've got this distributed consensus commit log on every server. We've got a replicated state machine, and all of them have their log of input events coming in now in the same order. So we've solved that consensus problem, um, and this log on disk is like a ring buffer. Um, so you you write new operations to the log, and then you execute them through your in-memory state machine and you've got all the state in memory. Um, and now the challenge is the, the log wraps around and when it wraps around, we lose the previous entries. Um, so we don't get to recreate those in our in-memory state machine anymore. Um, plus we've now got all this state that we need to persist. Um, so we've got to get, we've basically got to get that in-memory state snapshot it to disk and we have to do it before the log wraps around or we can just have an infinitely long log that would also be okay right uh, yeah infinitely long would certainly help but sadly we have to deal with real world real world hardware limitations here um because we are doing an actual actual systems level programming yeah um, yeah it's truly if... infinite yeah, yeah, and no, if, if it's infinite, we're going to have like infinite startup times also because when you start up your cluster, yeah. you're going to have to replay that whole log all over again. So the, basically the idea is we're going to snapshot our state machine state, all our account balances, all our transfers that we've done, and all the indexes on that, everything. We've got to basically snapshot that to disk. Uh, so I can give us like a little bit of like backdrop on how other systems do this. Um, and typically what they do is they just use the kernel and they fork the process. So they get nice copy on write from the kernel. Um, and they've got this, all this in memory state and they'll have like some background thread that's then snapshotting, writing that to disk. And if you've got like a few gigs of memory, that's going to take like 15 minutes to snapshot. So they'll snapshot the log like every hour or, um, in our case, because Tiger Beetle runs so fast. Um, we've got to be snapshotting like every 15 minutes or every basically every hour, yeah. then then we're using up 128 gigs of RAM. So it's kind of this race against time. The, the, the transfers are coming in and we've got to, storage has got to be keeping up with that um, pace. Uh, right. Uh, yeah, but there's really like a fork. Yeah. Also, so, using a fork like that is a really great way to exhaust your system resources because it, especially... Like just using forward without a direct exit exec right afterwards is a very much an anti-pattern and much or maybe people assume, agree that it's an anti-pattern systems programming because then you just have very unbounded memory usage that you can't handle errors for. Um, yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah, so it doesn't fit in with Tiger Beetle's static allocation um, principle. Where, so basically when you run Tiger Beetle, um, the binary is going to start up, it's going to do all the memory allocations that it's ever going to need at the start of the program. And that's it. It's never going to alloc again. Like, uh, <laughs> so yep. we, so we can't, that, we can't be forking the process. Um, yeah, that's not okay. Yeah. We also never free memory. So there's no use after freeze. No um, use after freeze. Hey, nice. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. What, what, what's the other problem with forking? 
like in our context. Well, um, one thing that's in that is rather unique to Tiger Beetle is that we have a storage fault model, unlike most other um, distributed databases. And that means that we actually handle um, disks or the storage devices, um, such as hard disks, returning just wrong, the wrong bytes, not the bytes we wrote to them. And so, if and we we then need to integrate this risk recovery um, of um, corrupted disk data to in, in with our consensus protocol through protocol aware recovery. Um, this is a, a very um, very cool paper that shows you how you can um, integrate the storage recovery code into your consensus protocol. That means that your storage system, read your LSM tree, needs to be then aware of your consensus protocol and able to recover data through that. Um, and so that's kind of it kind of forces us to then roll our own solution in some ways because yeah. we want this level of safety. We want the storage fault model and ready-made solutions don't provide this. However, there's also many other benefits to rolling our own solution that we can realize even though we are kind of forced to. It's not like it's a bad thing that we're forced to because there's a lot of other tricks we can then use yeah. um, because we have a very specific domain here. You want yeah, to go into a bit in more detail on that? Yeah, sure. So, yeah, so basically, yeah, to give everybody like a update, Isaac and I have kind of been cooking in the kitchen the last two months. Uh, we've been pair programming on this problem already. So we've kind of like done all the homework. Uh, and today we're basically just going to share it with you, like show you, show you what we've been cooking. But we've kind of also prepared all the ingredients. So all the carrots have been chopped, all the onions are diced, like uh, <laughs> um, the chickens are browned. I don't know what, what, what other ingredients are we using. Uh, yeah, the, the espresso is sort of measured and tamped. Uh, everything is ready to run. We've, we've dialed our grinder in, the mazza is just right. Um, and this has taken us two months. <laughs> but we, we basically got like all the, all the raw materials of the design for storage are there. So we're pretty excited like to share with you like what, what this makes possible. Like Isaac said, you know, doing that ourselves, there's a whole lot of cool new things we can do. Uh, but before we get there, just like, yeah, on the, so on the kernel forking side, the other big problem is it's not deterministic. So now we've got multi-threading. When you do multi-threading, you lose determinism. Now everything's up in the air. So, and why is determinism important? Um, well, because like the, like the last year or so, there's been, it's kind of like a whole new way of testing systems. Uh, it's completely different to Jepson, uh, which is maybe surprising. So Jepson like just destroys databases, which is fantastic. Um, the one limitation with Jepson though is it's not deterministic. So if you destroy the database with Jepson, um, you want to be able to replay that destruction of the database deterministically, because that way you can then fix the database. So you, you know, Jepson will find the bug. Um, but afterwards, you want to basically be able to just replay that bug again and again and again locally on your dev machine so you can just fix it quickly. Uh, so that's what maybe some of you would have seen, like what we did with Vstamp Replication Made Famous. We concocted this thing called the VOPA, like Vstamp Operation Replicator, which can basically fuzz the whole consensus protocol, but not just fuzz it like Jepson, it will also do it deterministically. So when you find a correctness bug or liveness bug, um, you just replay it and you can see your debug log, turn your debug logs on. Um, and it's just like first class tooling in Zig Spirit, like really nice way to fix bugs. Um, so that deterministic testing is so important. Uh, if we start forking, doing multi-threading, um, then we lose like this really powerful way of testing. Um, so just to, to show you, like with the VOPA, we found 30 bugs in three weeks and we fixed them all in three weeks. So you could find like very rare bugs, uh, replay them instantly, like in a literally a second. And it's just so nice to be able to fix bugs like that. You can, I mean, you're fixing like five bugs in a day, like no sweat, easy. But whereas if you have a real system running with another test harness, you can't do that. Um, so your test velocity drops. So, so now like where it would take you like five years to get a, consensus implementation mature. If you're doing these new testing styles that like Foundation DB also do and Dropbox do, with this new deterministic testing technique, you can now be like, you can shorten that five year aging process, make it like a three month aging process. Um, obviously you're gonna still learn stuff in production, but 
but you're getting you're just speeding up time doing it deterministically yeah so we couldn't so that's a big problem like that's why we couldn't use level db rocks db because none it's not deterministic they weren't built in a time where people wanted you know deterministic testing um so so that's like why you know if we were just sqlite and building not even a distributed database like we couldn't we couldn't use those storage engines because none of them are as far as we know they're like they're not they're not deterministic uh but like isaac said there's also this paper protocol aware recovery um because tiger beetle is a distributed database so that's like an uh, another problem also maybe you want to go into that isaac like a bit more in the recovery side yeah and so um recovery can only work or th this type of recovery we're doing can only work if things are consistent between all the replicas this means that every replica must have the same data on disk laid out in the same way and so this makes it this allows us to do very fine-grained recovery and so we basically just divide up our our disk for the lsm for the log structured for the log structured merge tree into blocks or 64 kilobytes say and then each block has its own checksum and if we detect that one block is corrupted we can we know that that same that every other replica which is up to the same point in the vsr log will have that same block on disk but hopefully not corrupted and so we can really just look at take, take this block um and send it over or send the send a request to another replica that says we want this block id um, please read it from your disk and send it to us, and we'll hope to check some. You have forgot the right the right version of that block, but without um, determinism, this you can see that how this breaks down very quickly. Um, if the we would then have to do a much higher level and more complex more complex recovery protocol, which also would have issues of the data being out of sync between replicas. Um, if if you introduce non-determinism anywhere in your logic or merge tree, then um, one replica may like decide to start compacting and get rid of some old, um, no longer needed data before another replica does, and therefore maybe delete data that we want to recover, uh, because that other replica has now like fallen behind a bit in the view stamp in the consensus log. Um, and so, without determinism, you can't really do recovery. But with determinism, recovery becomes quite simple, at least for our use case here, because yeah. we can just like break everything up into blocks and just. Whenever we read a block from disk, check the checksum. The checksum doesn't match. Go ask another replica, could you send me this block, please? And then wait till that replica sends you the block, and then just go on with your day, and um, <laughs> just be, <laughs> and you're, then you're back to the happy path where the disk yeah. didn't return you um, um, faulty bytes. And so, yeah. so this it's like, seems like a... Yeah. It's like ZFS on steroids, like distributed ZFS, where you've got like... If you it, the moment you become aware that you've lost a block, you're just reaching out to your your pal, like the other replica, and exactly. because everybody's got the same storage, all deterministic, and I mean, like, how big are these blocks? They're not they're not big. Yeah, right now we're planning on making them 64 kilobytes. Though we may change that in the future if we find a good reason to. But it seems like a pretty solid size, and so they're not very large. Um, that's not too much data to send over the network, and so. If you get lucky and only one block is corrupted, that's that's a very quick fix. Yeah. Um, and and even if there are many blocks corrupted, then 64 kilobytes is still large enough that it won't be too many messages. Yeah. Um, and like the, these messages are also not going to cause buffer bloat or block like your high priority control plane messages. Like you're not going to now cause these latency spikes in the network pipeline because you've got these like one gig messages coming through the network, and now your exactly, other control yeah. now you know so it's not it's going to be very nice. But what's the alternative? Like, if we weren't doing deterministic storage and we had to do recovery, like, say we find a corrupt block in our like one terabyte storage on disk, what would we do if we were like yeah, so another system? How how would they? How is it typically well, done? Uh, we could replay or just start resetting all the operations that have come in over the ViewStamp replication protocol to the other replica and have that replica then rebuild this its state. Um, yeah since it's lost data i believe that's the other alternative um if, or at least that's the, one other alternative maybe we're thinking of something different though yeah um, if, if the log hasn't wrapped we could do that if the log has wrapped we right. basically got to transfer the whole state like like so one then terabyte, you're transferring like 10 terabytes of data yeah, to, yeah which yeah, is so not feasible so it's like a whole day or how many days is that just to recover one one disk sector failure like uh, yep 
so that's uh, that's yeah. definitely that's just not not feasible in production. That's as good as having no recovery. Um, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Eventually. And that, that's basically like protocol aware recovery for consensus based storage. This is the paper we're talking about. And that's from University of Wisconsin, Madison. And it came out in 2018. And it won best paper at like the top storage conference fast. Um, but that's the cool thing. Like we're really lucky we get to stand on the shoulders of giants here. Like these are not our ideas. We just get to implement it. Uh, um, but it's also pretty interesting because it's such a new paper, like the research is 2018. So that means a lot of systems, I mean, it's not every year that we get to design a, a new data, you know, distributed database, but it means that we can now put in ideas that didn't exist when a lot of other systems were being built. So it, it seems to be like a lot of systems, when they snapshot, each of the replicas will just decide independently when they're going to snapshot. Um, so they all have different snapshots, so you can't, it's much more tricky to diff them because the, it's all different. Um, and yeah, so basically that's the problem. You hit a, hit a single disk sector failure and, and you have to cover your whole state. Um, and, and typically, yeah, like storage fault models weren't really a thing also a few years ago. Um, corruption on disk, people didn't really, pe people kind of said, well, you don't have to worry about it at your global consensus distributed layer. Um, if you have a local storage fault model, uh, a fault, well, we've got redundancy. So the consensus is just going to somehow fix it. Um, and it, it turns out like that isn't actually correct. Like um, what the protocol aware paper showed is that um, you can have like a cluster of three machines, three replicas, one of them has a single disk sector failure and that's enough to destroy data across the whole cluster and shut the whole cluster down. Uh, just one disk sector failure. Um, but a lot of systems today are still saying that like it, that, that can't happen, but, but it actually can happen. And, and the reason why is because typically they do the local storage code is one abstraction and then they do the consensus code as another abstraction and never the two shall meet. So they're not integrated. They don't think about each other. And the whole thing with this protocol that we're recovery for consensus based storage is that it's showing you that if you want to do consensus correctly, like everybody says Paxos is so easy. <laughs> like someone actually said that to me, Paxos is so easy. And I said to them, no, it isn't. And we don't even do Paxos. We do the real thing. We do this stamp replication. Like the, the, the original, you know, I mean, Paxos is great. It's nice in general, but if you want to do state machine replication, well, view stamp replication, which is basically raft, it's, it's the real version of raft or the original raft. Um, that's really what you want to use. Cause that, that's actually how you turn Paxos into what, what target beetle is. Um, but, but the thing is that none like Paxos raft, none of them work for storage faults. So they don't consider it. So they have all these formal proofs, um, but the proofs actually fail if your fault model now includes disk sector failures. And basically, cut a long story short, like that's protocol aware recovery. That's what one best paper just saying, you know, look, in our formal proofs of stuff, when we do consensus, we actually have to think about, you know, is the disk uh, lying to us? Because if the disk is Byzantine, then our non-Byzantine fault tolerant consensus is also going to break. Um, so basically, long story short, Target Beetle, that's why we need to do our own um, LSM tree. But why, Isaac, why did we pick an LSM tree? Like, why not just do B trees or why not just actually take our in-memory state and write the whole, like, 128 gigs to disk? Yeah. Oh. Well, um, we also want to be able to query data back from disk efficiently. So that's the reason we won't just write our whole log to disk linearly, because then it would be impossible to efficiently query a 10 terabyte log. Um, and B trees are also, would be another option. You can query them more efficiently for sure, but they have much greater write amplification than LSM trees. Um, there's a reason most, or I guess, I think all modern databases Use a log structured log structured merge tree to avoid like write amplification. That includes like SQLite, Level DB, RocksDB. Um, I think you'd be hard pressed to find a modern database implementation that doesn't use a log structured merge tree, just because the oh, performance is a lot better. It. Because 
disk is not rewritten or, or data is not rewritten repeatedly or as many times a disk as in a B tree. With a B tree, whenever you like insert data to a node, you've got to rewrite that node to disk essentially. And this then um, this then like spirals out over the whole B tree as you then like rebalance the tree or potentially it spirals out. With a lock yeah. structured merge tree, it's much more um, you have much fewer, much lower write amplification, and so it's structured like a pyramid. Um, and so new data enters at the top of the pyramid, and it gets written once a disk there. And then you have got some number of levels. Um, say you've got like seven levels, and each level is bigger than the last one with larger tables and um, more data. And so as data is appended to the top of the table, um, that's like the, the fresh data, and that shadows potentially older data at the bottom. Like you, so you mean like, query the tree, is, start at the is, top this like an, down. is this like an object that's coming in at the top, like a new transfer, and that exactly. can maybe shadow another version of it older down in, in the tree? And so you never you never mute, mutate data on disk. You always insert immutable data at the top. And this shadows then perhaps older immutable data, um, like an older version of a transfer, or you can insert like a tombstone to delete something which would then shadow the older version where it's actually there. And then over time, um, you want to compact your LSM tree. And this means taking stuff from a higher level, um, making it into a more compact sorted layout and rewriting it into a larger, which you take several tables from a higher level, potentially from level zero, then rewrite them into one table on level one, or then take um, one table on level one and, and merge that with a couple tables on level two. And this, this um, compaction algorithm um, is what keeps your tree fast to query because it, it basically it reduces gaps in these in these linear tables and makes the data more layout more compact. So it's then and each table's got a smaller range of keys, but it's, it's more a more full range of keys. Um, how, and how it do shifts you, data down towards the bottom of the tree for longer term storage. Um, uh, um, how do we like know where to find like say so we've got this pyramid um, and say okay here's a right. tiger beetle account. And the count, like it's very simple in Tiger Beetle, it's just some balances. So it's like a 128 byte little object, an account. Um, and that balance is going to change like super fast. So every time that account changes, we're going to put it in at the top. And then at the bottom of the tree, we'll have like different versions of the account with older balances. But now we want to like look up the account. We want to, it's maybe it's now sunk somewhere into the haystack. How do we find it? Um, how does that work? Right. And so we just start at the top of the tree in that case. We go, we look at each level in sequence and see, um, well, we, we have to have stored metadata in memory. Um, well, it, it gets persisted to disk as well, but we store metadata in memory to just like say which, um, what table, what the like minimum and maximum key of each table in each level is. And so data in, in stored in our LSM tree is broken up into tables, which are um, a basically a on disk representation of some range of values and their keys. And each table has its own um, bloom filters or perhaps a more fancy variant of filters, which we haven't implemented yet. But we can query efficiently to see if a key is in the, is in the table or not. And we can also see the minimum and maximum possible keys in the table. And so we'll start at level zero. Um, and the, and look like the, the, the values there. in the table are Basically, like a table is just an array of values. It's just it's just a group of values, and they all sorted. So you've got this yeah. table with a min key and a max key, and yeah, over, over to you. Plus, plus a bit of metadata to then make querying these the things we want to query faster. Yeah. Um, but that's pretty much all a table is. In in like it, the the data stored there is just a, a chunk of values that are sorted, and hopefully at least hopefully with not massive gaps between them. Because that would then lead to that's that kind of fragmentation makes things slower for queries and whatnot. Yeah, um, you know what, I'm, what I'm thinking is aiming to resolve this maybe, fragmentation maybe, that can occur in tables. I'm, I'm thinking maybe we should rename our array our tables and call them arrays because they look, look like just sorted arrays. Of, hmm. uh, but I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but it is kind of like a table right. is just just actually an array of sorted values. So yeah, so you sorry to interrupt. You want to go back to like how we actually query now? So basically, we've sure. got this this table. Uh, we've got this tree with a lot of tables at each level. Each table is maybe like how how big. Um, it depends on the level, but we'll make them probably up to sixty-four megabytes in size. 
but lower levels they may be much smaller, maybe closer to four megabytes or even just two megabytes. Um, and so at the lowest level of the tree, we want to have larger tables because that will then, um, if we have a lot of large tables at the lowest levels of the tree, that gives us like, the, so one thing that, that's important about, to know about the tree is that the churn happens a lot more towards the top. That's where new tables come in and that's where they get, get compacted most frequently. Um, but once tables sink towards the lowest levels of the tree, then they're already quite compact. Um, there's not going to be many large gaps in the tables, and there won't be many more cases where this table will get rewritten to disk. And so once tables are at the bottom, we want to have them in the largest tables possible because then we don't then it's more efficient to address large amounts of data. Um, and we won't have to pay the price for having a large table as we won't be rewriting this table to disk very often, if ever. Um, and so um, that's why we have the different table sizes at different levels of the tree um, and have smaller tables towards the top where we need to query and rewrite and compact tables more often and larger table sizes at the bottom. And so when we query, um, when we want to look up, say, a single account object in the tree, we'll just start at the top of our tree and then we'll, we'll check, check the tables at the first level if our key could possibly be in any of those tables. If it is, then we'll go look at that table, confirm whether it's there or not. Um, and if we find it, then we're done. If we don't find it in the first level, then we just proceed to the second level, do the same thing. We check if the key could possibly be in, it, in any of these tables. Then if we think it might be in one of these tables, we go look at that table and read it from the disk and actually do the whole um, exhaustive search on the table to see if we find the key there. And so this is a lot of binary searching essentially, to find whether a key is present in a sorted array of values. Um, and so we've, we've spent some time thinking about how we can optimize this best. And it's, it's still like an open question for us. We haven't landed on a solid solution yet, but we've implemented several interesting algorithms. Um, we've implemented a binary search that is completely branchless and uses prefetching to um, prefetch cache lines before they'll be used, which is pretty fast. And I, I um, spotted a pretty cool uh, PR landing in Zig. Oh, by the way, uh, what about this language that we're writing this in? Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> so we haven't talked about that at all yet. We're writing our our, our database in Zig. Um, that's Z-I-G, um, which is a new systems programming language that aims to... Er, has the same like target use space as C roughly. And this is a very, it's the language tries to be as simple or simpler than C, but without, but with the same level of power and, so, and low level control. And so if you want to contrast this with C++, um, C++ is a far, far more complex language, even though it has the same level of control as C. Um, Zig is a quite simple language still. And it also aims to get rid of many foot guns that C has. Um, for example, we have in Zig like first class slice types that have bounds checking. And so um, buffer overruns and read out of bounds is much, much safer and or you're much more protected against those kinds of um, vulnerabilities in Zig um, because the compiler will insert safety checks for those kind of things. Also, integer overflow is much stricter. Um, there's no macro or preprocess. There's no macros or preprocessor. You, instead, you've got um, compile time code execution. So you can use the same language used to write normal code in order to write um, compile time code that you would usually use need to resort to macros for in C. And so instead of having to learn two languages, a macro language and a standard language, um, Zig only has one actual one true language. Um, there's one a lot more language. to talk about with Zig, uh, <laughs> but um, yeah. Zig is still pretty early in development. Um, the current release is 0.8.0, but 0.9.0 is to be releasing, I believe, scheduled for December 20th, so in 10 days from now. Um, and there's some things that Zig doesn't have yet. For example, a um, CPU cache prefetch built in. And so earlier this week, I submitted a pull request to the Zig to implement this built in because we wanted to use it for our binary searches. And so there's a, there's a bit more work to do there right now because I found out that LLVM doesn't actually generate instructions properly or it fails to generate a prefetch on the instruction cache for x86-64 at least, even though it successfully generates that 
or um, PowerPC or ARM, for example. And so we need to, this is, this is an LLVM bug, and I found the bug report, but it's from 2014. Um, oh, so it was, so it it was actually look, a bug for... Oh yeah, it's an LLVM yeah. bug that, that they, they, they oh, should, okay. it should be ignoring this instruction if the architecture doesn't support it. That's what it says in their docs. But since LLVM is failing to ignore that properly, we're just going to add a blacklist for now yeah. until someone takes the time to go fix the LLVM bug. Um, and so we're going to blacklist x86-64 and x86, I believe, for instruction cache prefetching. But that's not actually what we need. We only need data cache prefetching yeah. for our um, use case here. And so it's already working perfectly for that. It just needs a, the PR pull request just needs a tiny bit of polish to clean up that edge case and then add some documentation. But aside from that, it should be good to go. And hopefully it will land before the 0.9.0 release. Yeah. Um, awesome. Yeah. Uh, like fantastic so work pre- on that PR, you know, it was really cool to take a Thank look. you. Uh, so uh, what prefetching makes possible, if you're not aware, um, is a, it's a way to tell the, the CPU what data we're probably going to access next. And so the CPU, how it works, has got three levels of cache that w- make memory access much, much faster. The main memory access on a CPU is very slow if you're just reading from some arbitrary place in RAM. But if the CPU um, has guessed that you're going to read from that place in RAM, it can go fetch that memory ahead of time before it actually needs to do the read and load it into one of the L1 or L2 or L3 caches. And so and a binary that search also looks a bit yeah. like this, right? Uh, also, the yeah, the, the L1 cache is smaller, L2 cache is bigger and a little bit slower. L3 cache is bigger and a bit slower than the L2 cache, but all of them are way faster than main mem- than main memory. And so a binary search has got a very random access pattern. It it starts in the middle. If you have a, like a long array, binary search will first look at the middle element, and then like the 25% or 75% element, and then like keep dividing in two. And so on a large enough array, that access pattern is totally random, and the CPU doesn't can't, or isn't able to predict which stuff you're going to access next. And so a prefetch or if we tell the CPU ahead of time, in the next iteration, we're going to need this data, or maybe this data, or maybe this data. We can actually prefetch both so both locations we might look at wow. on the, for the in the next iteration of our loop. Bring it in. And if we prefetch both of those, and then the CPU can like load that memory in parallel while it's then finishing the the current iteration of our loop and doing comparisons on the keys of the stuff we're currently looking at, then this can accelerate the algorithm on large enough array sizes. Yeah. Um, however. You may have noticed that binary search is not like the best um, data layout for this kind of searches um, because you need to do this jumping around in memory. And so there's actually a different data layout you can... It, 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 isn't like binary search theoretically optimal? Like there's nothing, it's like the speed of light. Yeah, you right. just can't go faster. Yeah, you can't go, you can't get better big O complexity than binary search because um, that's just what theoretical science, computer science tells us. But CPUs don't really follow big O complexity here in terms of like their raw performance. The complexity still still, still matches, but you can get faster performance if you play better with the hardware. And the hardware wants to do sequential read accesses in memory, um, just starting at the front of array and just reading through it in, in sequence. And that would mean that you then load you could then load multiple um, keys into the into your cache without having to prefetch like several different cache lines and basically fill up your cache doing a binary search. And so there is an array layout um, um, called the Eitzinger layout, where you put the root node of your of your binary search binary tree in the first element of the array, and followed that by that you put the two children of that of those nodes, and then you put the four children of those two nodes, and the eight children of those four nodes, and so on. And so, so they, searching this tree if, if yeah. you know you're gonna like it's basically binary search you're gonna hit this value then this one or this one so hey let's just lay out the values in order in memory um one after exactly. the other so that that way it just goes zoop. <laughs> yeah. just read through the array in sequence and then um the cpu barely even doesn't really even really need help from prefetching that you can prefetch farther in advance um which becomes important when you have larger trees but um at smaller trees, the CPU will automatically prefetch the next few cache lines in sequence in memory, which will usually be correct for the dates in your layout. Yeah. And also, like the first cache line will already fit um, the first three or four comparisons potentially, depending on the size of your keys. Um, and so, obviously, this is this plays a lot better than the CPU cache. And our benchmarks have shown this to be the case for large enough um, 
we have a large enough array we're querying, the Eitzinger bench our singer layout is so significantly faster than binary search. Um, wow. We don't know what what exactly what what we'll be using in practice that will look like yet because our it's still a bit up in the air exactly what um, size of arrays we'll be searching on, and so we kind of need to let the system mature a bit more in in the design space. No and be able to benchmark the whole system at once potentially aside instead of just doing isolated array searching benchmarks to know what would be best for our use case because introducing the Eitzinger layout um, does first of all it uses more disk space since we still need to store um, the values contiguously for um, range queries for example and we then also introducing a bit of more complexity then because then we have like a, a separate set cache of keys for doing the Eitzinger search um, and then we need to keep in sync with the other ones, and it's just like it's just more code, and more stuff could go wrong potentially. Though our code is well fuzz tested at yeah. this point. So ba basically, so, like yeah. to re recap, we've got this uh, this table, which is basically just an array of sorted values, and if we know that the table has got a min key or min key and a max key, we're doing a search. We start at the top of the the pyramid. We check these tables. Do they intersect the key we're looking for? If they do, do a binary search. Do a binary search. When you found it, you stop, because otherwise you're going to see all the values further. But basically, that's the whole idea. So it's all binary search all the way down. And we've got these tables, sorted values, and we're adding a little bit of extra. Um, we, we're keeping them actually in normal sort order. And then we're adding a little like mini index on top in Eitzinger layout which is basically now we've got like one big pyramid. Imagine our table of sorted values. We've got our big table of sorted values. We do a binary search on, and then we create a little mini index in Eitzinger layout. You can now search in there. It's like an accelerator. Uh, it's like, yeah, like a little mini accelerator. This will tell you it's basically a way to, to be able to jump into a smaller area of the haystack of the table. So here, here's your big table, yep. which is like a big 64 meg haystack. Now, now we want to like jump into a smaller area so that we basically cut out a whole lot of cache misses. Maybe we should also explain to people like how we think about performance. Like, I guess to make Tiger Beetle fast, uh, do we basically have to be very careful with CPU instructions and not do any assertions and like be careful with division and multiplication. Like it's all these CPU hacks, like it's all about the CPU making that fast. How, how like, what's the secret like to going fast? Is it all that stuff? Yeah, so that's a very good thing to bring up right now. Um, in Tiger Beetle, for performance, we, meet, we find it very useful to make a separation between a data plane and a control plane. The data plane is where you're the amount of work you need to do scales um, linearly or exponentially or something with the amount of data coming through the system. Um, and so this in the, in the data plane, it's important to worry about the CPU instructions and how fast the CPU search will take. And like just the, on any overhead you could eliminate, you probably want to eliminate there for performance reasons. However, in the control plane, this is code that is a high level and this like switches, this kind of like switches large batches of data through the system. And so in this code, um, adding a little bit of overhead or using a few extra CPU instructions won't make a difference um, because that, that cost gets amortized over large amounts of data. And so in this in the control plane, we want to have as many assertions as we can uh, to, just for safety. We want to um, do redundant checks if, if we can, like just have checksums and everything and check them redundantly to make sure we don't introduce any data loss. And so because of the split, we can we can have this level of safety without losing, without negatively impacting performance, as we keep the data plane highly optimized, but have a higher level control plane that switches data through this pipeline. And so, um, yeah, that's pretty much how how this works. And we also keep our our code single threaded for, or our control plane single threaded essentially. All our code is single threaded, in fact, because of IOU ring. But we keep everything single threaded so that we can more easily reason about the control plane. Because if we introduce multi threading and concurrency into our control plane, then it becomes a lot harder to write correct code. Writing correct, um, correct multi concurrent code in a low level language is very difficult. And 
well, it's it's ne nearly impossible to get right immediately. Uh, yes, and the theoretically impossible. You know? after, <laughs> theoretically impossible. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we we re we recently just saw a level DB bug, bug report, I believe, where they had discovered um. A, a bug causing data corruption that had gone unnoticed for a long time, which is, which we believe was essentially because it, it came about because of concurrency. Um, we haven't, we didn't go into terrible amounts of detail there, but um, large systems that have concurrency and that are not trivial um, will probably have race condition bugs at some point. Like they're just waiting, they're ready to be discovered because it's, there's so much, um, there's too much going on. There's no way to really get people on your head so without formal verification that I should say. It is possible like, to form, formally verify this kind of thing, but it's not the standard. That's not what most people do. Um, it's basically like, our solution is to like, just keep things single threaded. Exactly. Like that, that level DB code we looked at, what was interesting was they had control plane stuff, which is one dimension. Then they were doing multi threading. So that adds a whole nother dimension. Um, then they were doing C++, I think, so another dimension. <laughs> well, we're just kidding here. Uh, but I mean, like, like Jeff Dean and Sanjay are like our heroes, you know, like, um, and we, I mean, if it wasn't level DB, we wouldn't be here to get today. So we, I mean, we're just trying to like, kind of pay homage to like level DB. That's our roots. But, yeah. um, but Jeff and Sanjay, if you're listening, like we did spot that maybe, you know, I mean, Isaac and I, we've been learning like, if we if we reduce dimensionality in our code, it's just easier for us, like because we're not superhuman, like Jeff yeah. and Sanjay. Are. And like, we also uh, <laughs> we're pretty much we're also a fault model for the code. If we write bugs, yeah. then our code um, will will break, or our database will lose data, or something like that. And so we want to reduce our ability to write bugs and to have bugs in our code that don't they go undiscovered. Yeah. And eliminating concurrency is a really good way to do that because it eliminates a whole whole massive classes of bugs. And if we can do that without losing speed and without losing without negatively impacting our performance, then it's a really really positive trade off for our yeah. use case. Yeah, um, it's just so so simple because now like you you look at a piece of code, you're not seeing any memory barriers or memory ordering code like that's gone. So now you've gone from four dimensional thinking to like three dimensional thinking then you like eliminate like uh, other stuff and, and, and it just gets simpler and simpler until eventually you just seeing control flow. Um, that's, that's like yep. been helping us a lot. Yeah. And because of IOU ring, we can have this single threaded control plane while achieving data parallelism um, by essentially using the kernel as our thread pool to do all our input output IO and reading from the network and whatnot. That can all happen yeah. in parallel inside the kernel. And our control plane always just gets, to, gets notified when something's, some bit of work has been completed by the kernel, and then can keep on making decisions based on that work. But all the work can happen in parallel inside the kernel yeah. um, and become someone else's problem. And that, that's also the thing, um, like, like level DB, like, again, it goes back to like the history of things. So like level DB was like super early for its time, like, um, like more than 10 years ago, you know? So, um, and back then they didn't have IOU ring. So if you want to make compaction go fast, you've got to do, you've got to have a thread pool because they didn't have asynchronous IO on Linux. So you had to have like a, a user space thread pool. Like they had to do it, you know, so kudos, you know, but now well, like- They could have done direct IO and in in ASIO or whatever it's called, like that old weird API. Yeah. But it's exactly. not really practical if, yeah. if you're doing direct io but but again like like level db is more like a user space general purpose library for different kinds of programs but we like for tiger beetle we know we want to do direct io because it's faster and it's safer um so um yeah regarding that if you want to look into that then there's that paper can applications handle if sync failure from university of wisconsin madison again like just why direct IO is you have to do it if you want to handle like storage faults. Um, but anyway, maybe we should go back a little bit. Is there anything else like why we want to do our own LSM? Like, so, so I guess like you touched on it. So B trees, they do a lot of random writes. So as they rebalance, like they, they're writing to random locations on disk, which isn't fast. Um, and Tiger Beetle, like right. most of it is about very fast write ingest because we've got like a million transactions a second coming in. 
um, we've got to write that to disk sequentially, so we're not doing lots of random writes. Um, we B trees are better for reading, but Tiger Beetle we don't read as often. We just you know put the transactions in, and every now and then we're looking up an account balance. Um, but maybe right. yeah, what what have we missed so far? Like what? What about well, else, like the why, the, why the LSM, or, or why do I own the LSM? The two, yeah, we cover like yeah. the two main like social shoppers of like why we have to use our own LSM, um, which are essentially that we need determinism so we can do protocol way of recovery. Um, yeah, and we need and determinism that, that's kind of for, for testing. For testing, yeah. exactly. Those are the, those are the two, and so because we need to do our own LSM, we can actually. Um, make some different design decisions because we're very aware of what this LSM tree will be used for. Like level DB, they use a generic LSM that you can put anything in and um, it supports like arbitrary length keys, arbitrary length values, and it's just like a key value store like that. Our LSM implementation is a lot more domain specific because we know that we only are going to be ever putting in like two types of data, just accounts and transfers. And so if we make the LSM only store like fixed size values with fixed size keys, we can reduce a good bit of overhead there of storing key lengths, for example, on the, disk. The, the length, um, length prefixes, we don't have to store that anymore. That just becomes that like makes things faster. comp time and, and zig. Yeah. Yep. So we make our, our, like our LSM type generic over the size of the key and the size of the value. And so that then gives us um, code doesn't have to branch on the length to read stuff from disk. Um, code doesn't have to, um, like comparing keys becomes, um, much simpler when the keys are all the same size and we all don't have to, we also save disk space then because we don't need store length on disk and there's a bunch of nice benefits there. And we also made a realization where you might be asking then, how do we store both accounts and transfers? Well, the answer is we just have we, two we just, LSM trees. Oh, I thought we were going to put them all in the same LSM tree. We just have one, right? No, we can have an LSM forest, um, uh, so <laughs> and that mean, means we can actually, just store. Th this isn't about uh, Tiger Beetle's LSM tree; it's about Tiger Beetle's LSM forest. Okay. That's right. Yeah. Um, we do, we store all our different. We store accounts and transfers in just separate LSM trees. Each LSM tree, one LSM tree has only accounts, one has only transfers, and it also actually increases query speed because then you're looking for a specific account, you know already which LSM tree you want to go to because this is the account, the, all, all the accounts are in the same tree and they're nowhere else. And so when you're looking through this LSM tree for accounts, you're not looking past transfers. Um, there's not anything else in this tree aside from what the stuff you want to look for. And so this makes this means there's a lot less data in this tree that you're searching for to find this account. Which, um, and, and, and so it's also if because, we stored everything like, in the same LSM tree, you'd have to like search past all the transfers to find the accounts. Yeah. And, and, and like in, in, down. in Tiger Beetle, there's like billions, gazillions of transfers. There's like a hundred or a hundred thousand accounts. It's like totally different. So they right. basically now we've got disjoint sets. Um, yeah. Yeah, and there's actually we've got a lot more than two LSM trees there. We actually have something more like twenty to thirty because we also create a different LSM tree for every index into accounts or transfers. Um, like we allow looking up accounts um, by account ID or by timestamp of, or by the amount of money stored in the account or all these different things. And so each of these indexes, um, these secondary composite keys would have their own LSM tree essentially. Um, and so, so uh, you might let, then be asking just, like how, let, yeah, let me just get this it. right. Right. So, okay. I know the answer, but I'm just, we, we're just making this fun, but like, uh, so you're saying that we take like for a transfer, we've got the, the account we debit, the account we credit, the amount of the transfer, we've got like 10, 10 different field key values that we want to create a index on. Cause by the, by the way, LSMs are great for range queries because all the data is sorted. You can, you can get you know all transfers where the amount is between these ranges of but but you let me just get this right you're saying that like for transfer we've got like 10 different key value indexes and we're just going to stick all those 10 different key value indexes into one indexes lsm oh no we stick each index into its own lsm so we could have the account user data index lsm and then the account 
um, opcode user or LSM. Yeah. And so we have really have for 10 indexes, we have got 10 different LSM trees plus one LSM tree for the transfers themselves. And so we realized at some point that this just, just this makes querying faster. This makes um, the overhead less because not all the, the indexes are the same size. Sometimes we have 32 byte indexes. Sometimes we have 16 byte indexes. And so if you have only, if you want to put those all in the same tree and you have a fixed size, your LSM tree can only handle fixed size data, then you need to make them all 32 bytes instead of having some of them be 16 bytes. And so you waste it, you waste memory disk there. And so you might be seeing like one issue, like how do we manage resource, resources between the LSMs? Like if we've got like 30 different LSMs, wouldn't that like be too much overhead? Um, but we've got a solution for that too. Um, yeah. You want to explain that? Or... Uh, shall we? Shall we keep keep everybody in suspense? Like, uh, sure. We, get, <laughs> we can get get to that like in a, in a little while. Like, um, uh, may, maybe we could say like, w like why why could we not just use level DB like and create thirty different level DB instances? Like, I guess okay. So so there's overhead. What what's the other reason? Like why? Why, why would we want to put all data in one LSM? Or in the past, why would people have done that? Oh, there's also the, the case of snapshots. Um, and so this, this comes into, um, so level DB, for example, allows you to snapshot the state of the, of the LSM tree and then kind of have a window or like a frozen um, point in time where you can then query the state of the tree, I believe. Um, and if you had two level B instances, you would not be able to snapshot across both the LSM tree instances. Um, you see, you wouldn't, there'd be no way to have a frozen point in time across both L level DB instances. However, because our LSM trees are aware of each other, and we're talking more of an LSM forest implementation, we can indeed like have snapshots that span across all our LSM trees. And this is quite critical for our domain of financial accounting, because it's pretty common to want to look at um, or store a snapshot of some point in time for then auditing um, transactions or whatever yeah. an accountant would like to do with this data. Yeah. Um, and so um, snapshotting needs to be possible across all the different LSM trees. And that's, that's I think, the main reason why we can't just, why using level DB in this way would actually be impossible, not just um, high overhead and slow. Yeah. Um, and and the other reason too is that like with snapshots, if I understand correctly, I think with rocks with rocks and level DB, both of them the way they do snapshots is they use in memory like info to manage the lifetime of the snapshot. So if if the process running rocks DB or level DB if that crashes, you've lost your snapshot transaction. Um, why yeah? So why is that a problem like for Tiger Beetle? Well, we use the snapshots also for our consensus, consensus protocol. Um, the consensus protocol needs to be um, needs to need snapshots to be able to um, recover from crashes, and so that means we need persistent snapshots on disk, essentially. And we need yeah. to. Uh, we, it, or maybe yeah. maybe another way and of so, saying it is like we need we need the snapshots to be deterministic in terms of the consensus protocol, because otherwise, like what can right. happen is like one replica crashes, loses its snapshot, comes back on. The other replicas, they know about the snapshot. Now, you know, depending who's the primary, your snapshot might be valid or invalid, which can be confusing for the client. Not a great right, experience. Right. So we want, we, we want, we realize like we want to actually, that the forest needs to have snapshot isolation, like for transactions across all the trees. And we want that snapshot to be persistent because then it's just a great experience. Um, but like, and for the domain of Tiger Beetle, like why does that, like we kind of like just stumbled into this as we were going, like what, what really yeah, and so falls out of it? For accounting, it, it, it's common to like store like um, a quarterly report or a yearly report on like what, the, what was the state of the, the accounting history at this point in time, like for each quarter and each year. And so with snapshots, you can just, like create a snapshot and then it's stored um, in our database as long as you want there until you evict it or run out of space in your database. Um, yeah. 
And it's not like, it's basically like a hard link on Linux, like creating a snapshot. You're not duplicating any data. You're just now not, de you're not deleting those tables while the snapshot's alive. So it's kind of like, it's kind of like copy on write, how that works in, like in fork. Exactly. Um, it's, it's, it's only the data that changes that you keep a copy of. Uh, yeah. And so snapshots are pretty much as low, low overhead as they can get in our design. Like yeah. you, you're, yeah, you only need to, yeah, snapshot data only comes duplicated if then compaction like makes newer tables from the same, from the older tables. Yeah. And so if the snapshot's like still around, then we can't delete the older tables after compaction. We need to keep them around so that they can be yeah. queried through the snapshot. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, awesome. Yeah, I'm curious now. So how do we solve this overhead problem? Like of these, you know, how do we have like just an LSM forest now with 30 trees right. in? Like how do we, and how does that and fit so, in with Zig, Zig's philosophy? Because I think that's that's pretty so, cool. Indeed. And so, um, how we've man, how we've decided to manage um, storage allocation for our for our database is that we will let the operator just specify a command line argument that says, okay, use 10, 10 terabytes of disk for this cluster, and then we'll take that ten terabytes of disk and we'll split off um, enough for the BSR log, a few gigabytes. And then we'll just take the, the the bulk of this memory will just be split up into blocks. Um, we talked about blocks earlier. This is like our lowest unit of disk space for the, our, the purposes of the LSAM tree implementation. And so blocks are currently 64 kilobytes in our implementation. And um, these blocks, this block pool is just like our, we, our, our disk essentially. Shall we touch on quickly like why we thought 64 might be roughly right, like uh, in in the like in um, the zone. Sure. Do you want to explain that? Okay, cool. But uh, back to you. You must carry on that train of thought. Uh, so, yeah, okay. basically, just if anyone was wondering, 64 kilobytes, uh, it seems to be like a sweet spot because, like, for example, if you're using um, kernel bypass I.O., like not, not even running your I.O. through I.O. you're not even going to the kernel, you're doing it straight from user space to the device, then like SPDK, which we don't use because that's too difficult. Like we're not, we're not that good. Uh, like, <laughs> then, uh, we, I feel like a novice always, like it's just learning, you know, and, and pushing stuff through. But um, if, if you were doing that, the advantages of that start to fall away when you get to 64 kilobyte block, block size, because then basically whether you go through the kernel or do kernel bypass, you, you've kind of already amortized all the bookkeeping overhead of going through the kernel. So 64 is like a good number there. And also our thinking is, I mean, our minimum could be four kilobytes because we do direct IO, it must be sector sized, must multiple of a sector. So we figured like, if we're gonna pay the cost of doing an IO, well, let's do a little bit of read ahead. Let's, let's then do a little bit more 64. Um, and it also helps with like minimizing metadata overhead because the bigger the blocks, the less metadata about them. So this, it's and it's kind of good for network recovery. If you make it too small, now you've got too many too, too, your network protocols too chatty. Um, so we can tune it, but like 64, C maybe um, you, it does mean if you want to read something and it's not in your in-memory cache, you have to read 64 kilobytes from disk. Uh, so you pay a bit of read amplification there. But, but yeah, back to you, Isaac. Yep. And so we've got this disk divided up into 64 kilobyte blocks. And, but these blocks are owned by the forest, not by an individual LSM tree, essentially. So the forest keeps track of which blocks are in use by some table and which blocks are free. And so we've got this in memory data structure called a block free set is what we're calling it, which is basically just a bit set of um, which blocks are currently in use, which, pets, which blocks are not, at least the API is just a bit set. We'll probably end up, we're going to end up making it a bit faster than just a, a plain bit set eventually, but it will allow you and basically D, yeah. just say. D, DJ D, on the team our, has been our, doing awesome work on that. Like he's been sorting indeed. that out, doing like killer work. Yeah. For sure. It's also got like a nice compression, in, um, because we also need to write this block reset to disk eventually. So he's got a nice compression implementation going to make that faster and take up less space on disk. But the API, like for the LSM trees is they can just request and they can just tell the forest block free set to say, give me the, a free block. Then they get like a 64-bit address of the block and um, they can then write to this block on disk. Um, and so each LSM tree just kind of has 
are access to the same pool of of memory of, of disk space so they all use the same disk um resource um and so there's no real way there's no like shared res there's no resource that l some trees like have individually aside from like the, a bit of metadata overhead um and so we have to have like some metadata for each LSM tree indi individually, but that's very small in comparison with the amount of disk space they use, which we then can share completely between them. Um, and so in this way, like each LSM tree can just use as much. It's also less than flexible because depending on the usage pattern of Tiger Beetle, we might have more accounts in some usage is usage scenarios and more transfers in others. And so this then makes it flexible so that then if the user like uses 10 times more accounts than we expected that we get 10 times more that, that accounts LSM can just be 10 times larger and take up more disk there. We'll still run out of disk when we hit the limit of like 10 terabytes or whatever the operator chooses. Yeah. But um, how that disk and is I, used can be, it's very flexible. And you, you're saying like how the disk is used, how, how do we think of it? Is this like a lot of different files on the file system or oh, can we actually oh. just make this work on a block device? Um, so we could totally use a block device. Currently, we've got this implemented as a single file, um, which we just f allocate on startup or on cluster initial on cluster initialization. But all our code would work just as well with a block device. And so long term, we may use that for increased performance. Yeah, and, and the safety. nice the nice thing there is that you you avoid all the file system bugs. So like Dropbox, they had some stuff internally where they were, from what I read, they were. I mean, they even had to write routines that when you hit a file system bug, they have to like erase, reformat the file system. Like you, you need all this complexity in your operations management just to deal with like file system issues um, because file systems generally are not storage fault aware. So they get corrupt inodes, you know, you get those problems. So, and, and you get like the performance hit because now you're going through the file system. So basically like the way Tiger Beetle works is we think of it just as like a partition, like, and you, I mean, literally like it can be a partition or it can be a raw block device. We just take like four terabytes. Let's cut it up into 64 kilobyte blocks. Um, that's, that's kind of yep. what we're talking about. Like it's that simple. Yeah. And so we can definitely, we'll be, we're very flexible there to adapt to whatever the future brings in terms of, um, um, best practices on disk IO and on operating systems, because I'm sure that will continue to develop as um, disk hardware develops and as file system develops and as the Linux kernel becomes more featureful and complex and fast. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we've, we've got a very simple requirements to place on the operating system. That's kind of one of our, our philosophies here, though we do um, prefer to have a, a nice modern IO system like IRU ring. Other yeah. than that, we're pretty we're not very picky. Yeah, um, and Pr Prady's been doing awesome work also, like on uh, the whole IO stack. So like getting getting Windows support, um, Mac Beetle, getting Tiger Beetle running on Mac, like doing interesting benchmarks all on KQ. Like, um, how do we, we want to do what one shot, like multi shot, um, IOCP, AFD on Windows, like all of that stuff. Uh, but kind of like the production focus is for Linux. Um, so IO Ring for the win. Um, and how shall we like how how do tables work out like is a table now just one 64 kilobyte block uh. no um our table tables actually um they're they're variable sized or they can be up to some max table size we will configure at compile time and tables have one index block um which is also then so the address of the index block is then also kind of the address of the table so you only need one address to find a table. And then this index block will contain addresses for several um, data blocks or many data blocks and also several filter blocks. So the filter would be a Bloom filter or a binary fuse filter um, and allow us to efficiently query whether a piece of data might be in the table or whether it's definitely not in the table. Yeah, because if, if it's that could definitely be, that will not in be... the table, we don't have to even read that block from this. Um... Exactly. So we can just only read in the, the index block and then a few filter blocks instead of reading in um, all the data blocks or enough data blocks to query. Um, and we only have to read in one filter block because we'll be able to know which filter block would tell us about this piece of data because each filter block will cover like many data blocks. 
Yeah. Um, and yeah, we can get into details there at some point in the future, perhaps. But cool. we have um, tables. Tables can scale up to currently um, 64 megabytes is our compile time configured maximum table size. And so that means, um, yeah, many blocks of of 64 kilobytes. Yeah. Um, that, that, that was like some of the cooking that we did, because basically, like, like we said, we've been pair programming this out like since mid-October. Uh, every day we catch up like four hours solid coding. It's like fantastic. Uh, and we're both pair programming this. Uh, Isaac's typically like um, driving, coding, and I'm navigating, like watching, thinking, like, and it's, it's been fantastic, like working like this. Um, and what, yeah, that was like what basically when we started, we we kind of had a fixed table size, like two megs, four megs. Um, yeah. And then we like we broke away from that because we realized like it, this comes back to the question of overhead for the LSMs. So how do we how right. do we like minimize the in memory overhead of everything? Yeah, and so if we have like four megabyte tables, then you've got you need a lot more tables to use up a hundred terabytes, for example, of addressable storage or ten terabytes even. Um, if you make did the you, table size did you larger, say, did like, you just say a hundred terabytes? I did say 100 terabytes. Um, that's kind of like our, our uh, I guess, long term. Or just, uh, we want to just like not limit ourselves. We want, don't want to back ourselves into a corner. And so, if we someday have a way to address like 100 terabytes of disk, or either locally or on some other cloud server or whatever, we want to be able to have that opportunity open. Um, but we're not sure exactly what that would look like long term. But we want to make sure our design is flex or scalable enough that we can we can have metadata for at least for 100 terabytes of worth of tables um, and be able to efficiently query that. Um, and so and that what, that's a like, pretty. What, what's our um, like where are we at now? Like our actual in memory overhead. So say we you know we had to scale like that far because I mean actually that we've been thinking about that because it's kind of realistic because we know like there's some deployments that could be using Tiger Beetle and they've got like 60 terabytes of data already. Um, so, so we want to be in the, in the, you know, on the, in that order, but like, what's our like current total memory overhead across 30 LSMs? Like how much memory do we need? That's a good question. I'm not, Just, I don't know if spreadsheet pulled up right now, but, no. um, we worked this out yesterday. Um, we worked out like how much memory we need for the manifest, which is our, like our in-memory data structure that keeps track of um, what tables are on disk and what how much or what key ranges they have essentially. Um, and so, I believe for just like storing the that we we end up with something like two thousand um, blocks worth of manifest data. And so, if each block is sixty-four kilobytes, then we have uh, grammatic pause for the calculator usage. <laughs> are, you, are you using Python yeah, or Node? No, uh, yeah, Python. Python, yeah. <laughs> of course, we have something like, um, we, have, we have about 100, um, 100 megabytes worth of, um, of data for the manifests, like 130 to 200 megabytes um, worth of overhead. And that's for that's across all LSM trees just to address um, this much storage. That's assuming 64 kil 64 kilobyte um, blocks. And so that's yeah. So that's that's um that's the amount of like table info entries we need. So table info for each for each um, entry in the manifest, we need to store essentially the address of the table, um, the minimum and maximum key of the table, then a checksum of the table, which is going to be a, a 16 byte checksum. Which then allows us to detect if reading this initial table block um, got was we, if we, if we find this block is to be corrupted. We can't just rely on the checksum in the block itself. We want to have a checksum out of band. Um, yeah. And there's a feeling like there's I feel like there's one other thing I'm missing here. Um, maybe me, not. Though. Me too. I'm also trying to. I know it's there, but I'm trying to the think. Timestamp, of course. Ta yeah, yeah. The timestamp <laughs> of when the table was created. Um, yep. So the timestamp is important, for example, for snapshots. Um, that's how we will then like determine which stamp, which table the snapshot can see, um, because the snapshot will have like a, a timestamp range of tables, which it has a view of. Um, yeah. yeah. So ba basically, like snapshots are so simple, like you know, across the whole Alice in Forest, like you want snapshot isolation 
um, then basically all you do is you, like you've got these tables. Each table has a timestamp, which is always increasing. Um, if you want to create a snapshot, you say, okay, give me a snapshot, which is just a timestamp. And that timestamp, if you plug it back in, when you do like a read query or you're doing like a range query, like, um, like a relational query, because LSMs let you make a, a fully relational database. So Tiger Beetle like is relational. It's not SQL, um, but it's relational. Uh, so the, you, you take that timestamp when you want to now do the query and it's so, so easy. You basically now, when you look at your big haystack or your, your big forest of trees, you just ignore the tables that were created after your snapshot. And when we do compaction of tables, like we take one table and combine it with the overlapping tables in the level below, we just make sure we can do all of that, but we just don't delete the tables if there's a snapshot timestamp that could have could could be seeing it. And that's that's snapshot isolation done. Like yep, really, that's, really that's pretty much all it is. It sounds so simple, doesn't it? It's, yeah. it's, it's a little bit more complex um, to like deal with in practice because it does, it isn't like an extra feature, but um, I think we, we, we arrived, it's like several design iterations into, into snapshots for sure. We yeah. went through a lot of design iterations in this one for sure because our initial plans were not that simple and were a lot trickier to work with and also didn't work. But yeah, um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we're pretty happy with the design we've come up with it for that now and yeah. hopefully implementing it will go smoothly and everything will just work out beautifully as yeah. we imagine it will. Cool. Hey, yeah, just uh, so just so Isaac, you know, like everybody's saying hello. So, uh, Larice, Andrew, cool. Stephen, Omar, like, uh, welcome, Stephen. You just arrived. Uh, he's an hour late. So, he's asking, like, do you have sequential ordering? Like, speaking of sequential timestamps, timestamps, how do you handle clock synchronization across the cluster? Um, so, I guess, so maybe these timestamps are just, they're just like U64, it's just an increasing number. So, so right. as you as the LSM forest creates a new table, it just bumps the counter. But Stephen exactly. must, must start explanation of um, how we make this all deterministic across the cluster. So we haven't really spoken about that yet. How do we make sure that all these LSMs do all the work in step? Uh, oh yeah, and so our Loris, our oh, by, by the way, Loris says uh, Linux right? Linux moment. <laughs> right. Yeah. Anyway. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we need something that will some some deterministic input that will drive our compaction, and we have that because we've got a consensus protocol. And so as each op goes through the consensus protocol, we'll call essentially LSM forest.tick method, and then this tick method will go out to each of the LSM trees and tell them to do a little bit of work. And this work is most likely will be compacting some tables, but to avoid um, like massive latency spikes here. So say we've got like a 64 megabyte tables, right? Um, if you were to do that all um, synchronously to like just write 64 megabytes to disk, that would be a massive latency spike in your consensus algorithm. If you did that like every like 100 ops, you had to write a 64 megabyte table to disk. And so, so let, me, should, should uh, I just, let, let me double check, right? We've got our, okay. our consensus log. So this is view right. replication. So we get a log of batches, like a batch has got a whole lot of transfers that we want to execute. So a batch of 10,000 transfers, batch of 10,000 transfers, each of the batches is an operation. So we've got this like ordered consensus log. It's very simple, just batch, 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 batch operations. Yep. And we execute them one at a time. And like what you've been saying, Isaac, is basically in between executing an operation into our state machine, we hook in, we have a little tick, and we then tell the LSM forest, okay, you do a little bit of compaction work, do a little bit of flushing work. Um, yep. So they, as they process this deterministically ordered, like it's totally ordered across all the replicas because of the consensus, um, that means all the replicas are processing in lockstep, they're calling tick on the LSM forest. Exactly. And our only goal with the, with the compaction and the LSM trees is we, all we need to do is keep up with the incoming data. As long as we're compacting fast enough to handle um, the, the input data we're getting through the consensus log, we're, we're, doing, we're doing fine. And so we just need to, we need to just balance out this work to keep up with the incoming data. And so instead of writing 64 table 
60 more megabyte tables or large tables out synchronously, we've broken up our compaction algorithm into like a, an iterator of sorts where it'll, at each, at each time we call into our tick method, it'll do a little bit of work to move the compaction forward. And so on the first tick, it'll just kind of read um, a bunch of the input tables and get stuff, get data in memory for the next tick. And then on the next tick, we'll then do some CPU work to merge tables together, do a KOA merge algorithm and get stuff ready to be written. And, but it'll also in parallel, we have been submitted a read to the kernel to then get stuff ready for the tick after that. And so on each tick of the compaction, we then end up doing in the, at the peak of the compaction parallel, parallelism, we're doing a read from disk, um, a KOA merge in memory or in on the CPU in memory and also writing the previous results of the last merge to disk. And so a compaction algorithm then has these little blocks of parallel work that it can do at every op of our view center replication protocol to keep up with the incoming data from the um, users and the clients of the server. Yeah. Um, Maybe, and so, what do you think? Shall we, are we gonna like look at some code and like, uh, do you wanna share your screen and we can jump into like sure. compaction and show all the iterators? But shall we, do you, do yep. you have that little like, diagram that we've got of remember from our discord chat of how we do the like the overlap pipeline compactions i can pull it up oh. just a second let me just first pull it up and then i'll share my screen so basically this was like one of the key things like the key differences we wanted like the um, compaction to be totally incremental so that you never have these latency spikes so um yeah it's literally right. like hopefully you guys can see my yeah. screen now yeah um Yep, we can. Are we all good? Cool. Yep. So this would be here. We, we see like our kind of waterfall approach to compaction, where um, we at the first that we each each of these vertical lines represents like the uh, a tick. So each each of these things. So in the first tick, we just do a read. Um, on the next tick, we do a read, and we do like the CPU work for um, what, the what, first what is, read. What is the read going to be reading like as we're doing this compaction? How does the compaction right. work so, across levels? At, at a, for a given compaction, we need to take input data from the level above. Um, so we have, we have always two levels of all, involved in the compaction. We've got like level A and level B, let's call them. And so the input, well, the, how the compaction works is that we take um, input an input table or input tables from level A, and then we read, we look at which tables in level B they overlap with. And then we read those tables from level B into memory as well and combine that data with the tables with the input tables from level A and then write that data back to level B. And so basically we take a table from level A and we merge it into level B, um, resulting in more tables than we started with in level B. Yeah. And we so we'll, remove we'll the table from like, level A then after the, yeah. Um, Andrew says that the Tiger Beetle cameras are working out really nicely. So thanks, Andrew. <laughs> so basically we're going to pick one table, level A, then we're going to see which tables below it overlap. Um, so we'll we'll typically pick like one table up here and then up to 10 tables below because we haven't said that yet, but each level is roughly 10 times bigger than the previous. And we enforce that as an invariant. So that means you pick one table, you pick up to another 10 and you're going to do a K-way merge and then output the new tables, delete the old ones unless they're referenced by a snapshot. So. Yeah, that's our read. So basically read is we're reading, you know, the first block from each table before the K-way merge. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. And so we just need to make sure we've got enough data queued up in memory that we can do the, the work of a full CP, of a full K-way merge to produce a block that we can then write to disk. Yeah. So that looks like, um, yeah, we just need a, basically a block of data from each table or at least, at least a block of data from each table so that we then, yeah. even if the K-way merge takes all the data from one table, we don't run out of data in memory, and we yeah. can fill up a full block that can then be written on the next step. And that and CPU so, zero that's there, that's just saying, that's the CPU to merge the first block, block zero. Like yeah, we're gonna, so, yeah. we call this like read zero. Yeah. Um, this is read one. Yeah. This is then read two. Okay. Cool. Mm -hmm. Hey, multiple select for the win. Yeah, Cocoon is pretty awesome, isn't it? Yeah. This one. All nice. right. And so we now have this. Wow, well, I put zeros everywhere here now. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah. 
So we have read one, which then prepares for CPU one. Um, so read zero, CPU zero, and write zero. These all correspond to the same data. Um, basically, we, we read, well, it's not exactly the same data. CPU zero produces exactly the data that's get, that gets written in write zero. Read zero is a superset of the data that gets then merged into the CPU here. Yeah. And so we'll take input data from K tables and produce like then one block of output data from the CPU operation. And then read one may have less work to do because of that, because we don't use all the input data right away. And so read one will will basically just backfill what we've like popped out of the iterator during the CPU merge. And then um, writing the write zero will then write the same data that was produced from the CPU merge to disk on the next tick. Um, and so here we have basically a way to do or get parallelism, but single thread without multi-threading and just leveraging IOU ring in the kernel to do or to do um, reads and writes while our CPU operation is going on. In our yeah. code, we've actually kind so of we just the like, these two things. We, we, we're just um, like su submitting IO from the control plane without blocking, without multi-threading. And we're actually like, yep. we, we, we submit the read, submit the write, and they, they've gone under into the kernel and then we do our blocking CPU. So we're doing it all in yep. parallel uh, in the pipeline. Yep, and so these really be swapped around. Which we actually have this is, this diagram was written back when we didn't hadn't made that that, that realization yet that we actually yeah. we should be doing write zero before we do CPU one. Yeah. yeah. And so these things, this is like the the real order our code implements this in. We start we submit the read, submit the write, then we do the CPU work, and we wait for the read and write to finish, and then we're done with the tick, um, and we can move on with the consensus with the consensus protocol or with the, with the work with L, other LSM trees. Yeah. Um, yeah, so do you want to go jump look at the code that's doing this? Yeah, now? let's go um, for it. Yeah. Shall we do shall we look at the compaction iterators and then we can take a little break after we've gone gone through this? Looks good. Sounds good to me. Yeah, well, so here what well, do we want to maybe we should start at the lowest level here and go yeah. um, first of all is the font size good? I made it pretty big already. I think it's yeah. it still fits everything on screen. Yeah, we cool. can we can we can um, go a little bit smaller even. I'm happy if everybody's okay. happy. Uh, cool, cool. How's that? That's great. Yeah. I can go there. That's, it fits a little bit more on screen that way. All right, Andrew, so let's go. Andrew says it's more than big enough. Uh, cool. Yeah. Um, let's go. Look, first look at the read iterators. That's like the first step of our pipeline. Of our pipeline. And so we've got two different read, read iterators. We've got the table iterator and the level iterator. Table iterator is what just reads a single table from disk. Oh man, this font size is really big. It doesn't yeah. even fit a whole hundred lines on the screen. Yeah. I guess I went overboard this time. Um, no, it's awesome. You, you're on the big screen now, so it, it's bigger than it usually is. So this is, this is cool. perfect. Cool, not you can, like you, your you laptop can, screen. Exactly. You can even go a little smaller if, you, if you're if comfortable. Okay. Cool. I'm go. definitely happy to go a bit smaller. Now more stuff fits on screen. So table iterator. Um, yeah, so basically this type is what was responsible for reading a table from disk. And so this will queue up, um, this, will, this has like a ring buffer of, of blocks. Block pointer is just like our, our type def for a, a array of, of U8s with the right alignment. Is we all, everything has to be, has to be sector size aligned in Tiger Beetle for, so we, that we can do a direct IO. And Zig allows us to put that in the type system. Um, so we just have a type def to that. So we don't have to type this really long type everywhere. Um, and so we have then essentially two blocks of memory here, along with an index block. So the first thing we do on, in the first tick here is we're going to read in the table index so that we then know where the data blocks are on disk and what their addresses are. So we can then read them in on future ticks. Yeah, just to recap, um, like a table, it's got one 64 kilobyte index block. And that index block has the addresses and checksums of all the blocks yeah. making up the table, like all the data blocks yeah, containing got, values in sorted order. Yeah. We do, we have got this table struct, or, which is then kind of contains our logic for the table layout. And so this is pretty cool use of zig comp time I wanted to show off real quick. Yeah. Um, we, we do some, some uh, algebra here, to essentially at comp time to figure out how to distrib distribute um, our, our keys and, and data inside each table block. And we also then yeah, that was, do some that was other like, That was us, us rediscovering linear programming, like how to solve for the optimal, yeah, optimal constraints, <laughs> you know? 
that was a pretty fun day um yeah. where we got kind of just like solve some some linear constraints um to figure out what or how how we want to lay out like data on disk depending on the key size and the value size and we also do some other just a simple common time loop to then have you to partition up our tables blocks into data blocks and filter blocks to get the right ratio between those um and then we've got this whole then we've got basically our layout is done then in these namespaces here which gives us like all the data about like how how large each bit of the table is on disk yeah and um then we have this this um this oh, whoa, block of content whoa, what is that <laughs> look at this this, this, this is verifies that the yeah. output of the of the comp time comp calculations up above are what we expect them to be, and then they fit within the bounds we wanted. And so, if you want to know like anything about our table layout, you can kind of just like go to this block here and read what all what all these numbers will will how all these numbers relate to each other essentially. And so, this is a pretty cool thing that Zig makes possible without like relying on macros or code generation or um, some other or just doing this at runtime or whatever. Um, this can all be done at compile time up ahead of time, and then we can just have this data layout kind of embedded in our binary. Yeah. Um, so that's a pretty cool use I want to get back to. And so then based on that data layout, we can then um, go back to the or FN table iterator. Now we can um, essentially, um, we just kind of read in the, the first index block, um, which we had described up above. It has then we know like where the data blocks addresses are stored in that index block. Um, and so on the first step, we like read in the index block. And then we then from that tick, then we have a data block. So we can then check if we've buffered enough values in memory. So this kind of just checks, um, have we buffered all the values of this table or have we buffered at least a, a block worth of values? Um, the data block um, maximum value count. Um, and so if we've if we've achieved that, then we just return from this tick function. If not, then we're going to go acquire um, our next block buffer from our ring buffer up above and start reading that from disk. And then once we've done reading that from disk, and we're going to then re just return from um, this is the on read function. This is when, then when we're done reading from reading that stuff from disk, we're just going to um, return to the parent that has called our function. And so this this iterator essentially just always Can ensures we... that um, we have um, at least one block worth of values that we can then pop from the iterator. And so the interface it exposes is then just a simple like peek and pop interface. We can peek to see if there's a value still available in the iterator or if we've like run out of values in this table. And we can pop a value from this iterator, which then consumes it from the iterator and frees up memory to read in more stuff from disk. And when, um, when we say there, like this is only safe to call, what we just mean is that if you call it and there isn't something to pop, you'll get an assertion crash. So it's not like it's exactly. like memory unsafe or anything like that. It, it's totally safe. Um, but if you call it, it's just going to, it's going to pick up that, that it shouldn't have been called and just crash safely. Um, yeah. Exactly. Because then we, we will then we... have this exactly. solution right here. Yep. To check. Shall, shall we show everybody like the this table iterator, just the, the ring buffer again of like how we only use two blocks and how this comes back to the Alice in Forest and overhead of everything? Sure. Um, yeah. So we have here um, actually two ring buffers. So um, one ring buffer just stores our buffers and we kind of swap between them. And so we always have like, um, we always want to keep it. We always have like at least one buffer that's hope that then got values in it, and then as that buffer runs out of space, um, we'll make we'll start reading into the second buffer. But um, there's also the case that some blocks, especially at the end of an LSM tree, might not be totally full of data block of values. In it's that case, there's a like chance the, we would need the, to, the yeah. tail of a table, like where the, the last little bit of a table isn't totally full. So it's that data and block. So like. Just to, um, so in that in that like edge case, we to um, to like eliminate that edge case in the rest of our code and reduce dimensionality, we've introduced a separate ring buffer of values. So that if we run out of buffers buffers in our in our blocks ring buffer, 
and we don't have yet enough values buffered in memory, we'll then just mem copies and buffers into a block sized ring buffer here to then free up a buffer for reading from disk. And so that allows us to like have a much simpler API here and like reduce dimensionality. And yeah. so, um, yeah, so yeah. we can, it's basically like this makes it possible to do the whole LSM forest, like have 30 LSM trees because each, you know, each tree is doing compaction. You've got 30 simultaneous compactions. They're all incremental with a, right. like pipelining, but basically like for every table, uh, so in one compaction, maybe you, you have like up to 11 tables, you know, 11 of these table iterators, um, each one only needs like roughly like three blocks of static memory allocation. So well, four because of the index as well, but yeah. Oh, the index it's block still, as well. It's that, four. It doesn't yeah. scale linearly with the data coming through. It's only like a yeah, fixed exactly. overhead. Yeah. And then we can pass as much data as we want through these iterators. Um, yeah. After whatever max table size we choose. Whereas otherwise, um, maybe like it could be like you're compacting 11 tables. Now you want to allocate like, like four megs for each table like and then that doesn't work with start and then 30 yeah. ls entries you'll uh, yeah. but this memory is if we didn't do this incrementally we yeah. need to read yeah we need to read like 64 kilobytes or megabytes into memory and then hold yeah. that in memory and compact it then yeah. um yeah, so, so doing this um basically just doing making this pipeline completely incremental with um minimal buffer overhead is what kind of what it allows us to excuse me, to have so many LSM trees without introducing too much overhead. Yeah. And so the next one above that is then the, t the level iterator. And so if you remember correctly, um, we have like one table um, from level A, and but we have many tables from level B in a range because um, we need to iterate those, those in order. And so the level iterator is what does that. This is now kind of has its own um, table iterator. It actually has two table iterators in a ring buffer. So it's kind of the same pattern repeated. Instead of buffers, we've got table iterators or child table iterators. Um, and so we'll swap between these as um, we use up data from the first table. We'll then start the next table iterator when that first table comes somewhat empty. And yeah. this kind of transparently then um, gives us an iterator over a whole range of tables in a level. Like and horizontal to level like B. switch from one to the next to the next. And again, like we do yeah. the same trick where we, we only need a ring buffer of two table iterators and then to handle the case where across the two of them you don't get a full block because um, we remember our kway merge we always want to be producing a full block we don't want to artificially produce like empty blocks because then it's like fragmentation um, um, or you know then our tables are not fully compact you know they're, they're there's more meter data so basically um, again we use that values ring buffer trick so if two of the table iterators are only half full, we'll take all the values, put them into our values ring buffer, which is big enough for one block worth of values. And then we've now got, you know, two free table iterators. We can read those in again. And that way our KWA merge, we're going to get this nice saturation. Like um, all of the streams are always guaranteed to have buffered at least a block so that the output from our KWA merge is always going to produce full blocks until we get right to the end right. and then we'll produce a partial block. Exactly. Yeah. And yeah. And so the, they have either at least a block buffered or they have all the remaining values in that iterator buffered. And so during the KWA merge, some iterators might run out of values, but that's fine because the KWA merge will just keep going until all iterators have run out of all values and then yeah. we're really done. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do you want to then go into the KWA merge next, or do you want to like do the high-level compaction overview first? Maybe that's uh, more reasonable. Yeah, um, I think. Well, actually, the KWA merge is cool because that way you see the we, sure. we kind of see what the high-level one is doing. Um, yeah. So you got this KWA merge type that takes in a bunch of generic stuff like our key value types and comparison functions and whatnot, and it also um, it has these these functions that then pick input data. And so we've got stream peak, stream pop, and stream precedence. Um, so stream peak and pop just correspond kind of for the peak and pop on the iterators we just showed you. Yeah. And so this is how you like get a, the next value from the stream if there is one, and pop is then to remove a value from the stream and just get return the value. Um, stream precedence, um, this is um, kind of a, a detail we need because we're doing an LSM tree. 
And so there it is possible that we'll have the same key stored in two of these tables, but one of them shadows the other one. And we know that based on the position of these tables in the tree. Um, yeah. And so we want to, we, we talked about already how we, how tables for values at the top of the top of the tree shadow older values at the bottom. And so we need to make sure that we get the, the right sort order here for the, for such cases um, between streams. Um, and so that's what this function does. But so other we, than that, we it's basically a pretty, like we, yeah. we try to bring in a little bit of the details from LSM land, like like as I said, like if, if we're going to drop duplicates, we actually solve that problem here so that outside the code is much simpler. And this is kind of like we can test this very well. Uh, exactly. Like the main point of extracting this type from the rest of the code is, to, is for testing, really. It's not to make it reusable because um, we're not going to use this anywhere else in our code base. It's just that we can have here at the bottom. Um, nice fuzz tests that will then um, exhaustively test all the cases we can never think of ourselves and yeah. whatnot. So we just have a fuzz test that basically like does a whole bunch of merges with random bytes and random lengths and random keys and all that stuff to test um, yeah, pretty much all our stuff. So we yeah. got some concrete tests just to like get our, get, just to get the tests working and then we have a, then a fuzz test here. Yeah. So that's the main reason to extract this uh, type outside of the or from the LSM code. Well, we also need to be generic over the LSM key and value types. But yeah, we we're not thinking this will be useful outside of our LSM implementation. Um, but yeah, other than that, it's a pretty basic binary heap. Um, we just have this this heap. It's kind of structured with arrays. So we can like reduce padding there. But yeah, we index with k with the maximum k, um, the maximum number of input streams, and then on initialization, we insert like the first value from every stream and call up heap to then um, sort these into a binary tree. And then on pop, we've got the o n or o log n pop. Um, this is like a wrapper to um, to handle the well. Why do we have this wrapper? This is to, this is to handle <laughs> the precedent <laughs> stuff, right? Yeah. We, been... <laughs> we're asking ourselves these questions all the time as we go over our code base. Yeah, yeah. that's like, why oh, we try to write that real code. Otherwise, we're going we're gonna to forget why we wrote the yeah. code the way we did. Um, <laughs> but yeah, pop internal does the classic, um, just it pops the, pops the fruit, fruit value. And then because we know that each input stream is sorted, we don't need to compare this key with the next one. And we can then just um, peek the next key, do our down heap to restore the binary tree structure. Um, yeah, it's a, just a classic min heap um, implementing a KWA merge. And, and we've got our down heap I and up heap algorithms here. I spotted something there called direction. Like, what is that all about? Direction, uh, indeed. Yeah. We have also made this iterator able to iterate in both directions. So this can be a min heap or a max heap which we think will be very useful for range queries as we won't always um, be going in the min direction there. But we haven't actually implemented range queries yet, so we're not sure how that will look. Maybe we'll yeah. get rid of this eventually. We're not sure. Yeah. But we have it because it was pretty easy to add. Um, yeah, we still want to do this like to our table iterator and level iterator because what we noticed is in some of the other LSM tree implementations, they they usually all this code works one direction only and then if you have a like a relational query that comes in and says right get me all the accounts where the balance is greater than this amount and get it to me in reverse order of when the accounts were created then that reverse order the query is slightly less efficient because they've got to do these like hacks to to fit so we didn't want to do like have that dimensionality we just wanted to, like, literally, if the query at the top is passing in ascending order, descending order, we just pass it into all the iterators and everything just works optimally. Um, yep. So, but like as exactly. I said, we're, we're still going to see how this works out. Hopefully. Yeah, so we haven't, we are actually, we are actually using it on the, uh, the descending direction yet, but we yeah. will very likely use it eventually for range queries. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, that's the KY merge. It's just a min yeah. heap. Um, do you want and to show or, like a, our ordered function? Yeah. Sorry. Should we take Should we take a look at one of those unit tests where you actually see like the inputs and and how the output comes out? Sure. Yeah. Uh, so this would be a a very simple unit test would be with um, three input streams, um, and we also um, 
we also have like the the stream precedence function where we say that this the first input stream is higher precedence than the second one, and higher precedence than the third one. And so if we have duplicates, we should see that the um, the, the the first or the I think I think I said that the wrong way around. We've chosen the the higher um, version. Yeah. Um, yeah. We even have duplicates in this example. We do. Yeah. Um, you... That one we've got, and I think we're picking from the last the last table here is the higher precedence. So that's why we picked yeah, okay, 11 yeah, right. from... Because we have 11 duplicated three times. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. We've chosen that the, the, the higher tables, this one's actually the highest precedence stream. I said that backwards. Yeah. That's why I got confused. Cool. But yeah, we take in these three sorted input streams, and then we, we produce a sorted output stream from the that has all the keys in sorted order. And if we see a duplicate, um, if we see 11 come in three times, then we take the... The input stream with the highest timestamp, um, the new most recent input stream, and we use that one essentially, which in this case would be the last one. And so you see that version is two here in our output. Um, and in our test code, we just use the index of the input streams to do the precedence. But in our actual code, we then base that off of the, of, off of the timestamp of the tables for, over which we are iterating. Yeah. Um, awesome. There's descending yeah. order. Um, yeah, then we have got descending order as well here. And the fuzz test basically just produces test cases for this, this merge function. And so it's just going to basically generate this, this hard-coded data. It will just be automatically generated by this fuzz function and then pass to the same merge function we use here in this test. Um, yeah, and we also test on a lot more streams. We test on 32 input streams and with a lot more numbers, of course, as well. And it's all random, but we actually hard-code the seed here. Um, or we don't hard code the seed. We have we generate the seed randomly, but we print it if if the test fails. So then we can hard code the seed for deterministic reproduction and debugging of the test. Yeah, um, that error defer is really cool. That like because try yeah. is returning an error. Like now it's really nice instead of just crashing on an assertion. Indeed. We, like, and so that's that's um, yeah. yeah Zig recently changed to um, making test functions fail with an error instead of. Um, is crashing when the, when the, when the testing you know, expect equal fails. This yeah. is a really nice um, thing that thing that makes possible to like print extra diagnostic information when that case happens where a test fails. Yeah. Um, so that was a that was a nice pattern Yorin discovered. Um, no, I didn't discover. I just thought, hey, should we try error defer? Like, it, it, maybe it, it should work. You know? <laughs> I think that, I think I'm, I'm gonna credit you for discovering that one, <laughs> whether uh, you like it or not. <laughs> okay, okay. But yeah. Anyhow, that's K-Way merge. And so now we can tie that back into our compaction iterator. Um, and so this tick function is now like the top level compaction tick that ties all these read and write and merge parts together. And so this, we, if we want to go back to the waterfall. Yeah, sure. Yeah, and we can also look at the struct for compaction because that's where we see the iterators sure. coming in. There we and go. so here we've got like the, um, the maximum table counts for the different levels. Um, we actually only will compact um, multiple input tables at level zero, if I remember correctly. And those we all can't uh, we we if there are any overlapping tables, we have to compact them in the same compaction. Yeah. Um, or, yeah. So the, levels the, that wrong. Level zero is the only one where we have to compact the uh, multiple input tables because. Yeah. We always have to, and we, we must compact, if there are overlapping tables in the input level, then we must compact all of them at once. Otherwise, we've got a chance to lose data, yeah. um, which we... And the, the reason is because level zero is kind of special. Level zero is the first level on disk. So we, oh, we kind of, we haven't showed it yet, but basically the LSM, the top part of the pyramid is all in memory. So as new data is coming in, we're literally putting it into like a, a mutable table and we, we're filling it up. And as that fills up, when it gets full, we then like close it out and get rid of the duplicates. And, and then that becomes an immutable table in memory. And at some point we have too many of these, we then start to flush them to disk and they get then flushed to level zero. Um, but that, that means that level zero is special because they're tables there that could overlap each other. In all the in all the other lower levels of the LSM, um, the tables never overlap. So if you want to do a read, no. 
you'll basically you'll check the mutable table, then you'll check the in-memory tables, and they could overlap, and you'll check them in precedence order from when they were created. So first check the mutable table if it's got the value you want to read, check your in-memory tables, then check all the level zero tables if, if they overlap, because you'll you'll have that metadata in memory. You've got keyman, key max for all of them. So check the ones that could possibly contain. And then you've got to check the lower levels, but now it's much easier because when you get to the lower levels, you only check one table because you know that the others don't overlap. And most of the data is in the lower levels, um, especially the last level. So that's kind of how the, yeah. So anyway, that's where this level zero table comp max 10 comes exactly. from. Exactly. Yeah. And so we, at level zero, we have to compact to the full first level potentially if all the tables in the first level overlap. So that's why we need to have at least um, the level zero table count as our level A table count max. However, at lower levels, even though we don't have to compact all the input tables, because there are no overlapping tables, there's no need, we can choose to uh, use more input tables if we want to. Um, yeah. And so we, we can make that decision based on basic performance characteristics that we discover over time through yeah. testing. Yeah, um, we, we're ba basically seeing like, right, okay, we've picked this table, it overlaps with these 10, and then we, we might see, okay, hang on, if we also just pick this other table, it still overlaps with these 10 and nothing else. Oh, hang on, like pick yeah. another one. Oh, they still just, and and at some point, like it's that's yeah. more optimal than and doing so, it separately. Exactly. Yeah. And so if, if you choose, um, if you, it, it, selecting the tables, this is like the main performance consideration here. Because if you select, if you do like good table selection where you choose um, tables in level A or a large number of tables in level A that overlap the, with the same number of tables in level B, then you basically get more work done for like very little extra effort. Um, Cause basically you just have a few more input tables, but you're still looking at all the same number of tables in level B. That doesn't change. Cause you always have to look at all the tables in level B that overlap with overlap, the tables yeah. in level, level A. Yeah. And so um, that's kind of what this stuff is about. And then we have here, actually our level A iterator is just the table iterator directly. Since level A, you only iterate over one table you iterate over all the tables in level A in parallel, um, and or you you need to potentially do that because of level zero. Um, at level at, at past level zero, you could iterate over those in series as well because they don't overlap anymore. But it's, hey, it's Isaac, simplest to I just think, have the general case for level zero. Have yeah, we just like have we just discovered a curveball. Like if we, what if we're compacting level zero, then we actually need to use. Do we use a table iterator there for level zero? Or do we, what do we use? Yeah, that's right. Well, we, we are using a table of zero for level zero, um, for level A. Okay, but I think level zero for level A, we need to actually have all the tables that overlap. Because in level zero, we could have up to 10. So actually, we might need a level iterator there. I don't think so, no. We just iterate over all the tables in parallel. Um, for all the all the tables in level A in parallel, we iterate over all the tables at once in different iterators, and so oh, we have them. Oh, of course. Oh, we've already solved it. Okay. Oh, we're good. Yeah, yeah we've got. Okay. We, cool. We've already solved it. We have. <laughs> we have. We have up to ten iterators in use for level A, oh, and we could at, at level. And so right now, our plan is to do the, just do the same thing where we iterate over them in parallel for level B as well. But I realized we could actually switch to a level iterator there if we're not at level at level zero, which would be an optimization, I think, because then we'd be doing we we'd still I think that I think that would actually be a good thing to switch to eventually. But we we can discuss that later, perhaps, once we start doing that kind of like table selection logic. Um, then we have our merge iterator, and then the writes just kind of happen inside the struct, so we don't have a separate iterator for those because those. There's nothing to iterate over, really. It's just we take the output data from our merge algorithm and rewrite to disk. And so that logic um, kind of happens through these little block write things. These just kind of carry a buffer and um, a one. context for our write. Yeah. Um, if you talk a bit about how we do I/O and like what this storage dot write thing is, um, so I/O U ring or Search slash io io linux now is it? No, it's just io.zig still. On master, it's io linux now. Yeah. It's called io linux as well. But basically, our io functions 
they have this completion struct. And this um, there's kind of like context for this IO operation. It's it this is like what um, kind of like the the little context pointer that we stick in the kernel ring buffer and then get that this we get this context pointer back. Um, or we get actually a pointer to this struct back after um, the IO viewing operation completes. And so the API that we have here essentially for um, operations, let's look at maybe, and I may not close, but like read would be a good example. Or write is the one we we're just looking at. Write, it just takes an IO pointer, then we have a, a generic callback type. We take a completion. So the caller needs to provide the memory for this for this completion struct. And so it's a kind of intrusive API with no dynamic allocation. Um, and so we just need to have this completion struct or a, a memory for this completion struct around whenever we want to do IO. And so this is like the low level IO interface. And then we have like a wrapper above this in storage, which um, kind of wraps that in a, in a bit higher level interface then handles like some errors and but as a, as a panic if you write fails essentially because that's the only way to handle um, writes robustly we, is to do consensus and panic if your write fails. Shall, um, we, shall we show everybody how we do read fail failures like with the storage fault model? Sure. Like, so we, we a bit more like, the disk cable is a bit loose or like there's a bit of dust somewhere on the drive platter. Like um, what are we doing? Yeah. So here we're trying to read like a bunch of disk sectors, like 10 disk sectors. Yep. And we, we try to read all disk sectors in one go. Uh, yeah, maybe shall I, shall I explain this one? What do you think? Go for it. Go for yeah. It. Okay, cool. Uh, so, yeah, yeah. So this one, um, so we want to read like 10 disk sectors. Um, so we submit just one IO to read, you know, at this offset on the disk, like a P read, and we want to read 10 sectors. So we always do everything in multiples of disk sectors so we can do direct IO because it's faster. And direct IO, you save on the mem copy because you're not doing mem copies into the kernel cache which we don't use anyway. Um, so it's, it's a, just a lot faster. It's also safer, like we explained earlier on. Um, so there's the paper, can applications handle FSync failure? So to be safe, we have to do direct IO. So we've actually got like a, we'll, we'll Tiger Beetle will panic if it detects that the file system in production, like if it knows it's running in production and the file system doesn't do direct IO, we'll just panic and say like, it's not safe. We can't run, um, we have to have direct IO. So anyway, so multiple of a disk sector. Now we do the read, we unwrap the result. And this is actually fantastic with Zig because Zig forces you to handle all errors. And actually like for databases, um, there was a pretty interesting paper. It's called Analysis of Failures in Distributed Data Intensive Systems. But basically like what's the biggest thing that's gonna make your database unsafe? Like how do you like what what do you need from a language to not be unsafe if you're writing a distributed database? And the result is kind of surprising because like a huge percentage of the time, the number one thing that makes like storage systems unsafe um, is just failing to handle errors. So thanks thanks to Andrew, like and, and Zig, we've got like, you know compile time checked safety. <laughs> like we've got the, this is like the syscall checker or whatever. We need a cool name for this. Zig must really market this feature. Um, but basically Zig is gonna check we are handling all possible errors that the kernel might return. So here, here we're getting an EIO. Um, and obviously other languages can do this too, um, but Zig has just got a really nice approach also positively. Um, so here we get an E and IO error. This is basically latent sector error. So we couldn't complete the read. So what that means is like, we try to read 10 sectors. EIO is actually, usually most of the time, it's probably just one of the sectors that failed. So a latent sector error means the disk tried to read all 10. And when it, when it read one of them or two of them, the checksum didn't work out or it hit some other kind of mechanical problem. So basically what we do then is we see, ah, okay, we try to read more than a sector, 
okay, so let's subdivide the read and we basically do like a binary search around the faulty disk sector. Um, so we read as much as we can um, and we, we work around it. Um, and then we even, once we've worked around it, we then go back up to reading more sectors. So our reader is going to read as much as possible. Um, and then higher up in the stack, we're going to get a checksum error that it failed. But because we've read as much as possible, um, yeah, we can then recover like the bare minimum. Or, I don't know. Did I explain that? Is that correct? Or, uh, did we miss anything? Yeah, I here? think that's, that's pretty good, I think. Yeah. Um, and so... We we also have this thing. We you already covered where we zero this. We, we zero the buffer in yeah. the case of um, yeah. Yeah. So now now we and found the sector. That, them. Yeah, exactly. We found the one that was the problem. We we zero it. We'll catch that higher up, um, and we handle all yeah. the other errors. Um, the panic. And, <laughs> yeah, and those shouldn't those shouldn't happen. Like we don't expect them to happen. So, yeah. This would then be like essentially a bug in the operating system, probably, yeah. um, or at least in our understanding of the operating system API, or maybe something. Basically, we something has happened that we don't expect should be possible, and so yeah. the safest thing to then to do for Pagabri is just panic and rely on our consensus protocol to um, yeah. deal with that circumstance. And this will then, of shall course, we... show up in the operator logs, the operator, and whatnot. Um, shall we? Tell everybody like that interesting thing we found here. Like, so we're doing direct IO, everything is a multiple of a disk sector. And then we're getting some surprising result in terms of bytes read coming back from the read syscall. Like, um, um, remember the short read, partial read. Oh, yeah, partial reads, yes. Um, and so you can get a partial read if still when you're doing direct IO, it seems. Um, yeah, so the, re the reason why is because um, like normally disk sectors are four kilobytes, um, but what happens is you have older devices, they do something where they emulate the sector size. So if you ask the device, like, what's your physical sector size? They'll say, hey, we're cool, we're also four kilobytes. Meanwhile, internally, they're actually 512, 512 bytes. So what could happen is you could... We're, we're doing everything using the advanced format, like disk sector size, which is four kilobytes, because that way we're always compatible with these older devices that actually only do 512. But what can happen is we do the read. Now you would expect, like the kernel will say, okay, well, I read some multiple of four kilobytes because we're doing direct IO. But actually it can come back and say, well, I only read 512 bytes, which is pretty interesting here because then we have to handle that specially. Um, yeah, and so we've got this this logic to deal with partial reads essentially. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, anyway, so that's that's there. Like now you know if you're interested, like you could go and check it out. Uh, we we try to make yep. make this code as understandable as possible. So if it doesn't yeah. make sense, let let us know. <laughs> Indeed, and I feel like the, the surprising part about this, at least for me initially, was that how often we just like panic whenever the kernel returns an error. Like for writes, we pretty much always panic when their kernel returns an error, which seems counterintuitive to many people, I think. But you have to realize that there's no real way to handle these errors because you don't know what the state is on disk. And you basically just have to rely on your consensus protocol and state yeah. replication to, to address at that point. Um, yeah, but we do, so, we, we, yeah. we do. So if there's silent bit rot, we'll handle that with our checksum or we won't panic. If there's EIO, right, right. We, we do handle that. And the other read errors are kind of just impossible. They're almost like unreachable. Um, it shouldn't happen. So we do we yeah. do like handle our whole storage fault model without panicking. Um, except yep. um, for for writes, this is the interesting one. Uh, we were chatting about it yesterday. Indeed. Yeah. Yeah, and so at the on writes, it's actually the case that. Um, the the disk the or the the storage driver in the kernel or I'm not sure exactly which level this happens on but something in the kernel in the operating system will actually check that your write succeeded and it, it may then like get uh, some EIO back from the hardware that the write didn't succeed. It will then transparently try to write again the same data to a different sector on the storage device and um, basically try and make that transparent to you. Yeah. Um, and so that's why we say here, latent sector error, no, no spare sectors to reallocate. 
This means that the, the, the kernel or the storage driver or Harper did not find a spare sector that could be used to then retry this write um, after the write failed. Um, Cause no, so that's also that, then an error for us, but this yeah. shouldn't happen in practice, assuming the hardware is, um, yeah, doesn't have any hardware issues. Yeah, no, normally like the devices will keep a few sectors aside. So if they're trying to do the write and it fails, they will transparently reallocate sectors. So we're, we're kind of assuming if, if the device gives us EIO, it's because there was no more to reallocate. But EIO could also happen maybe because of a faulty cable. So we're not even getting to the device. There's some other reason. But we anyway, we, we, we panic yep. and we come back up. Um, yep. And essentially, there's no way to handle this really except for like, no, I guess panicking, which then will notify the operator that something's gone wrong. They should probably check out the hardware. This is you're getting um, disk errors, and we don't lose data because we've got replicas. We've got replication across the cluster, yeah. and so as long as only um, as less than half of our replicas have this issue, then we're still fine, um, yeah. which is a pretty strong guarantee, really. Um, yeah. And this should be like pretty it, rare. Like this, this is this yeah. is all. Um, I mean, much, maybe much less likely than just bit rot or, or yeah. indeed. I mean, it, we can see how rare it is by how by the fact that most databases that are used in production today don't have um, this level of error handling for disk I/O failures, or they don't like check some everything they write to disk. Or um, yeah, yeah, they often. And, oh, oh, that was the other reason. Yeah. Like with going back to other sims, like um, the. There aren't, there isn't really much checksumming happening, or maybe the LS, other implementations, they don't have our fault model. So the LSM would break if you gave it misdirected writes or stuff. It, it wouldn't handle that. Um, yeah. Necessarily. And so somehow the world still works though. So it seems that errors yeah. do not happen all that commonly in practice. Um, yeah. But yeah. in the rare case that they do, instead of like some someone's server just mysteriously returning or someone's account balance mysteriously changing, um, that I guess be the, I think the worst case if the, your financial institution uses a database that doesn't handle um, misdirected writes and some misdirected write happens and overwrites your balance with like a really large negative number. Um, yeah. And the, the, I, the I, I had just, it once, yeah. like a pers personal story. Like I, I was running MySQL somewhere and it actually got corrupt. And after that, I never ran MySQL again and I got interested in like how this happens. And then I got into like ZFS and that was like eye opening because they said, well, this stuff does happen in production. Like as you start running a few more servers, it becomes much, much more likely that you hit it. And um, yeah. And then like, again, like the protocol aware recovery paper from Wisconsin, just showing like, if you're unlucky, like one disk sector failure, just one, and you've got a whole cluster of Kafka uh, log cabin, which is raft, like a lot of the systems, just one single disk sector. I mean, that happens like like pretty high probability every three years. But if you just have it in the right spot, you'll lose your whole cluster of data, everything gone. Like, I mean, that's pretty scary, you know? And basically like, it seems like we wrote to the protocol aware paper, the, the author of that paper, and we asked him, well, you know, which Kafka systems have patched for what you've shown? And there are some like proprietary systems, but in open source, it isn't, it isn't really there. So we thought, well, like, this is just it, like, we can, like a chance to do something new, you know, like let's carry on that ZFS spirit and like, just, just do it. And then it isn't actually that hard. Like, I mean, this is like 50 lines of code or hundred lines of code. Yeah. yeah I mean, uh, it, it's more just like, it's, it's hard from the design perspective, not from the code perspective, I feel like. Like your yeah. whole design needs to take this into account. And so that's why databases can't really just patch themselves to handle this because it needs to be designed for this protocol aware of recovery from the get go, essentially. Exactly. Otherwise, it becomes um, uh, near impossible to integrate with your existing system. Yeah. Because, um, like, when, when that direct IO paper came out, also from Madison, like, can applications handle F sync failures? When it came out, like, it took PostgreSQL like a few years like to get to move to direct IO like it's not because it, you've got to change yeah. the whole design so we like luckily exactly. we could yeah. just do this from the beginning just try and get it right yeah, yeah. we're just standing on the shoulders of giants like everyone else um, yeah like, we have but, like the benefit of so much so much research and 
um, years of experience from other people that have gone yeah. into Tiger Beetle's design. Yeah, um, and it's pretty fun to write in Zig here. Uh, like, this is so cool. Oh, yeah. Uh, Zig I, makes it just If you look easy. at the language in this kind of code, yeah. um, it's, it's so readable um, for this low level code, and it cares about handling these edge cases. Like, yeah. Yeah. Definitely happy with our choice of language here. Um, yeah. Where are we at now? I guess we got distracted from compaction stuff. So, yeah, we were um, about to like submit an I/O operation. In... Oh, we I think we were getting Indeed. into how we swap our block buffers. Uh, Indeed, yeah. And so let's just go through tech maybe from the start to kind of um, do you, just do explain you the high level control flow first. You want to um, quickly show the pipeline again because that's where we what um, that's what yeah. tick is going to do. I think I deleted that. Whoops. Or yeah, okay. So I'll just grab the pipeline back from uh, the chat log. Here we go. And so, tick. This function now is like each each column here is a call to this tick function we're gonna be looking at now. And so, um, on the first tick we're only gonna read. On the second tick we're gonna read and do CPU work. On the third tick, we're going to do a read, a write, and then CPU work, and so on, until we run and out of stuff to read, essentially. And the um, CPU work is going to produce one block, and the write yep. is going to write that block in the next tick. So it's it's merging one block, writing one block, and the reads just have to guarantee that we'll always have enough to produce one block for the write. Uh, yep. It's actually there's a there's an edge case where the write writes two blocks where we then fill up a filter block or an index block as we, and we can complete a table. But in general, we only write one. We always want to only write one data block, and then there's metadata blocks that also need to get written at some point. Um, and so that's all handled by this code though. So this is like the high level control flow. At tick or for ticks greater than zero, so all ticks essentially. This is just like a little. It makes the code a bit more consistent. Um, we can. <laughs> uh, we, 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 we wrote this read. yesterday, everybody. Uh. <laughs> yeah, we did write this yesterday. Uh. Um, and tick read just goes through all our level A iterators, um, calls tick on them, and increases our counter for pending I/O. And then we have this, this little assert here that says if this is the last tick of the compaction, if we ran out of stuff to read. Um, or if we ran out, if the merge is now, if the merge iterator has now returned empty, then we can assert that there's no more pending reads after starting um, the reads. So that just starts the reads. Then um, if the compaction ticks is greater than or equal to two, so no, there's, a, there's, a, there's a gap here for a tick one, but we'll, then we'll start a write. And this will like check um, if these writes, if, if data has been queued up to be written, we've got Potential, potential for three writes in parallel um, for a data block, a filter block, and an index block. So at the end of each table, when once the once we've completed a table in memory, we'll need to write three blocks at the end of the table in parallel. Otherwise, usually we'll only write the data block. That's the that's the the standard case. Then like every 20 data blocks or so, we'll write a filter block, and every once every table we'll, we'll write an index block. So that's just kind of this just checks if. If um, the merge code is queued up a block to be written, and if it has, then it will submit the write, and then do some assertions that the writes have been submitted and these these flags have been reset and whatnot. Um, and so that's that's that. Um, a compaction tick one. So this is after we've done the first read. We need to do a bit more initialization now and actually initialize our merge iterator um, with the, all the input streams. Um, and then a compaction text greater than or equal to one, we'll actually then um, first check if the merge iterator is empty. If we've like run out of data to compact, that means that we've read all the data from the input tables and we've already um, passed all of it through the merge iterator and queued it up for writing. And that means that we're now in the last tick. We can exit after the next call to tick. Otherwise, we're just going to call tick merge. And this will then um, do some assertions, first of all, preconditions essentially. And then it will go into our um, table builder. Table builder is like our kind of helper to help us build tables. Um, this just manages like the on disk layout for us without uh, having that bleed into this um, control flow code. Um, yeah, we've been we, basically like, the uh, data block. as we've been doing this, like we've been learning quite a lot. Like 
so like a recent thing that we both learned is like if we've got functions that are all about control flow then we want to keep the little details out so you can look at the function and maybe it's like 30 yeah. 40 lines and you just see the big picture um, and that makes it a much That's, easier this, this tick function is essentially yeah this like fits um this is only like 30 40 lines and it just yeah. does the high level control flow um dispatching into these um into these uh, separate functions that do like the, the separate steps of our compaction algorithm and each of these functions has, like, has then a whole bunch of like pre and post conditions potentially to then yeah. assert, assert that we're using it properly into inside tick but at the high level here you just see like the simple control flow and you get the high level overview of how this of how the this the cpu runs through this code and then in merge here um it's the same kind of thing where we we abstract the into the table builder the um like the the conditions we need here so we iterate this while loop until the data block has become full and to fill it up we always just pop um from our merge iterator um okay, otherwise we break with an assertion um and then append this value to our table builder and after we've either appended a full day after either the data block is filled up or the merge iterator has become empty and we've reached the end of the compaction then we'll call data block finish to write some extra metadata at the end of the data block once all, we, all the once all the values have been filled up and then we do swap buffers here and what this does um, is this swaps around um, two pointers um, so we have two block buffers one of them is like owned by our table iterator and one of them is owned by um, the write itself and this will just like swap them and then set block write to be true um, which will then trigger our write code to, to write this block to disk on the next iteration of tick so, so um, it's like, our, like just... we, we've done our merge we've just finished merging into a block and then we swap it so that that block is going to be written next and the block that was just finished writing that's going to be the, the block for merging next so, yeah on the next iteration of tick yeah. exactly yeah <laughs> Very similar thing like that like you would do in like graphics to like swap between two buffers. So you render to one buffer, when you're done rendering, you swap it to be displayed, yeah. and then you start writing to the, to the old buffer that was no longer being displayed. Yeah. yeah. The idea is that essentially, but now yeah. for just buffers, a compaction iterator in an LSM tree, yeah. um, and then we just have some more assertions here, and then we have we check also then if the filter block is full or if index block is full meaning we've reached the end of a table or if we've run reached the end of the compaction then we're going to finish the fill filter block off and write the metadata there and swap buffers to get that written to disk then on the next tick same thing with the index block if the index block is full or if we reach the end of the compaction if the merge iterator is empty then we're going to swap buffers and get that written to disk um yep so that's the high level control flow here and it works out pretty simply actually in practice Yeah, there we go. Hey, Ad Adrian and Don want to come say hello, everybody. Uh, <laughs> All right. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Hey. Can you see us? Yeah, yeah, we can see you. Yeah, the original yeah. Tiger team. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. All right. So that's the high level overview of how our incremental compaction works. There's a few to do's left here, as we haven't. We obviously have not finished this code yet, and there's a few to-dos still lying around. For example, we haven't really implemented the in-memory representation for manifests yet. And so there's Are some stuff about the table info where we just have a to-do to, to actually insert this to the right place in our in-memory data structure. Are um, we going to do that today? That's kind of uh, a big task. Yeah. Um, we've, we've been kind of yeah. scared to do the manifest structure like that. I don't know. You, I've been pretty scared about doing that. Uh, but probably it's going to be uh, easier than easier than we when we think. Yeah. Yeah. yeah well, I think we just we just don't know how it will work yet, and so it's like fear of the unknown, right? Um, yeah. I think it won't be too bad in practice. We we uh, need we know how it's going to be written. T-shirts that just say fear of the unknown, you know, and then then we'll be okay. Um, <laughs> For sure. Yeah. So yeah, if we're going to actually do this today. We're a little bit later, like we'll dive into that. That's going to be our first, and we haven't even practiced or prepared, so we're just going to like try and solve that problem yep. yeah cool. and yeah what's pretty awesome like with this compaction is what we're seeing is like 
we've got very few buffers in memory. They're mostly like 64 kilobytes and we've got three or four yep. of them per iterator and we're swapping like between two. Um, but this is enough to compact tables that are like multi gigabyte. Um, or it doesn't matter. The table can be any size and you can just cruise through it with very yep. minimal memory usage. Um, incrementally and this tick function we can basically tick as fast as we want so if we realize okay hang on we're not keeping up with the incoming data coming into the lsm forest we can just drive these ticks really fast in a hot loop finish the compaction um, otherwise we just tick them incrementally so we're constantly doing these little micro units of work and hopefully like the 64 kilobyte block size is just big enough to give us like i mean it's it, it's not it's not as fast as the sequential write throughput for like one meg or four megs, but it's not bad like for solid state um, or we can tune it. Uh, but yep. so this has been really that's, that's like kind of our, fun to figure yeah, out. Yeah. Our overall approach to design is to just kind of get things um, mostly right at least. We, we just might want to make sure we, there's no real show, show stoppers in our design. And yep. so the fine tuning of these yes. like of the 64 kilobyte number and whatnot can happen through then once we've got a system design like yeah. done and the system's actually built then we can tune those numbers and tune our system for like like for maximal performance but what we need to just avoid during the design phase and the early implementation phase i'd say we're still in is to avoid backing ourselves into a corner where we can't get out without changing changing the design radically and throwing away a bunch of work um yeah. That's kind of been our design philosophy throughout this these past yeah. two months. Uh, so we we're basically like learning from Andrew. We run Zig Zen on the command line every few weeks just to remind ourselves what we must be doing, and then avoid, avoid local maximum. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And trying to like trying to use back of the envelope numbers to to get to the right like global maximum. Uh, and Indeed. Just get roughly right. Oh. Yeah. But we're doing we're actually doing a lot of optimization in the design, but we do it not in the code, we do it on like napkins, you know, um, back of the envelope calculations, just working out, you know. But so the first few weeks of this, we were literally going one step forward, two steps back, and then we every day we're yeah. just noticing curveballs. But now lately that hasn't happened too much. Now we we seem to have like yeah like explore the whole like the, terrain yeah. Yeah. i mean the first week we didn't write any code at all i don't think um but like the rate of code writing has gone up um pretty well over the past month or so yeah um, we're writing more and more code and spending less time looking at scrub spreadsheets and scratching our heads and um throwing out code yeah so all, all of this is like from scratch we've been like a month and a half uh, is that right like yeah mid-october something like that yeah yeah. Um, I guess we didn't start coding until yeah about a month and a half ago, I'd say. Yeah, yeah, but but I think then we were even doing that was kind of when we started, like even just doing the Excel yeah, stuff. Yeah, this compaction iterator was just like this was only like a week and a half old probably. Um, yeah. This compaction iterator stuff, we were we were kind of doing this like last week, I think. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah cool. Fun times. For sure. Yeah, probably shall we shall we take a little five minute break? Um, For sure, yeah. Um, yeah. Awesome. Let's do yeah. That. And then uh, so Larice, like oh by the way, thanks to Larice for like helping us like get stream, you know, streaming gear set up and everything. Uh, so but I, I haven't figured out how to mute our stream. So Isaac will just have to mute our mics and then catch you in, in five minutes. See yeah, so we're just gonna get like a bit deeper, and then we'll actually get get into coding today. Even be pretty cool. Yep, I think the plan is just like start digging into the in-memory manifest design in yeah. implementation, right? Yeah. What What do you? Is there anything you want to show like after the break? Like, what? Anything else we want to look at? Um, uh, not sure. I think we've covered a like a pretty good overview of our storage system now. Maybe if yeah. anyone has any questions, we can then dig into those in a bit more depth. But yeah. There's nothing else I really feel need to show off right now. Um, yeah. Awesome. Steven maybe says talk about Superblock a bit. Oh, um, yeah, yeah. Superblock, Superblock might be interesting. And how we do um, copy yeah. and write and everything. Yeah. Yeah. Are we going to white, whiteboard the Superblock? Are we going to white, white, whiteboard it up? Uh, <laughs> we could. 
Or we yeah. can just look at the, the encode yeah. thing. Yeah, 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 encode. Okay, uh, cool, cool. So yeah, we'll catch you like in five minutes time. Uh, so, yeah, see you right. guys later.
and we're back. Hey. What, what's next? Uh, so we're going to look at Superblock. We've looked at blocks. Yep. So. Superblock of blocks. Very important is the Superblock. And so actually one bit of you know, we need to store that we can't recover from other replicas. That's the, that is the Superblock because it's so where we read on startup to find where our data is on disk. And um, yeah, this also stores critical part things about the, the view simplification log, um, which we can't really be recovered. And so to get around that that um, problem is we just store many copies of this on disk spaced apart from each other. So there's the chance of all of them getting corrupted is very low. Um, that's the basic idea with this. And then this also means that we need to rewrite many copies of this um, every time we do a snapshot or update our on disk. Um, yeah, the, 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 we need to make essentially writing this as cheap as possible to reduce the I've, latency we require to write this to disk. Um, yeah, yeah. I've, I've got a question. Like, so we, we were talking about okay. like, we've got our VSTAMP replication, our, our, our distributed log, the consensus log. So every, every, yep replica in the cluster there's like three three or five um replica servers they've all all got the same log some of them their log might be a bit they don't have the full log they're still catching up but the logs are always in the same order now yep and and they're ticking the lsm forest like as they go through the log as they go through the log they process an operation and they tick 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 that forest which drives everything forward. So the forest is like ratcheted off the log. So what happens if like, now we're doing this compaction, we're writing to these blocks and then the replica crashes, like, and then it comes up, like what happens? Like, well, um, what will happen is that if, if assuming the replica didn't manage to write the super block before it crashed, we just won't see the new the blocks that were, had just been written. Um, yeah. The the replica will always go read the the most the super block on disk that's the most recent, and this super block will not point to the new data that's been written. And so the um, the data may have been written to disk already before the replica crashed, but um, that data will just be essentially discarded. And then on startup, the replica will read the super block in and see where it's at in the VSR log, and then just ask the other replicas for the operations that it's lost and replay them. Achieving the same state on disk deterministically, and, um, and and as it replays those ops, it's gonna it's gonna basically just redo the LSM forest compaction work that it did, because exactly, it's deterministic. Yeah. So it'll just and then get back, and then at some point we basically uh, and, checkpoint the super block, and when, it's when you checkpoint the super block, then those blocks yep. and all that work becomes visible and gets. Yeah. Um, That's but otherwise, it's basically actually applied. Yeah. So that way we don't really have to worry, like if we're busy writing a block and then the system crashes because of power failure, the block isn't visible to the system because it's not referenced by the super block. So it's like ZFS like that. Exactly. Uh, and so the super block is kind of a concept we've borrowed from ZFS, I believe. Um, they've got the same kind of structure uh, where they have got a super block on disk. I'm sure other people do it as well, but ZFS may be the one who's popular, popular, popularized it. Um, the where they've got this kind of tiered yeah. approach where they've got one super block on the top that then has checksums for the blocks below it and um, is like the thing that actually updates your atomic state. And so right, checkpointing the super block and updating that on disk is kind of how we then commit a state update to our on disk representation. Um, if the super block hasn't been written, then uh, it's as as if we didn't modify the disk. Um, yeah. So it's pretty yeah. like nice, nice and relaxed way to work with broken storage systems because you're just like, hey, Definitely well, we didn't is. touch the super block, so don't worry. Like, um, <clears throat> and then come back after a yeah. crash, just replay the log deterministically. Um, and then, so why do we have to store? Like, do we just store the super block in one place? Like, how do we? Uh, or we store multiple work, copies like, of it. Yeah. So we so we're gonna yeah. write it in multiple places so it survives. Um, and how do we figure out the latest super block? Um, well, do we just overwrite um, the previous we'll super know, block? 
Uh, or no, we, we can't do that because that would be then. Yeah. That yeah, if we were to overwrite the previous super block, crash in the middle of writing the super block, then we're screwed because we've just corrupted yeah. our previous super block, and we've now partially written it over, and now we just don't have a super block that's that's complete anymore. Instead, yeah. we've got a a fixed number of super block slots um, that we always know, like their position in our data file at compile time. So on startup, we're going to go read all these super block slots. Um, and then compare it, like read each super block, check to make sure it's not corrupt, first of all. And then for the set of non-corrupt super blocks, we'll compare the versions of the of these super blocks and take, hopefully we'll find like um, at least three copies of like the most recent version. And then we're then we're safe and we know what we'll be using then for our yeah. for recovery and yeah. for our data. Yeah, um, so I've been thinking what we should do is like use some kind of read write quorum. So when you write, when you checkpoint the super block, what we'll do is we'll write like say two or three copies of the super block. So that's our write quorum of three. Yep. And then when we read in the super blocks at startup, we'll read in all the slots. They can be, doesn't matter how many they are, it can be like 10 or 16. And of the 16, we want to find you know, which are the three latest, but we also want to be able to tolerate storage faults. So then what we'll say is like a read quorum, we'll, we'll require 16 minus three plus one. So we have to be able to read 14 of the 16 slots. And that way we know that our read and write quorums intersect. So we can lose up to two super blocks and we're still going to be guaranteed that we'll be able to locate the latest superblock. Um, right. Yeah. But if we if we lose more than three superblocks, well, then we don't know what's the latest. Then then it's game over for that machine. Then we have to transfer the whole state from the. We have to do run a special yeah. recovery protocol for VSR for the consensus to get that node back up and running. Um, yeah. Basically, yeah. yeah I this think problem we actually, is, yeah. We don't even need the hash chain. Um, we, although it's nice maybe to cross check, but we can just use read and write quorums and find the latest super block exactly. timestamp. Yeah. Oh. Yep. So that's what the version and parent fields are here. The version is like the, it's just the monotonically increasing number that indicates what super block is the newest. And the parent is just the checksum of the previous version super block, which is just like to double check our work essentially. Um, yeah. that that's because like what I was thinking when we when we were doing the consensus stuff is like all these protocols they usually just use simple counters simple numbers integers that increase but the problem with that is that you can have two different machines that increment a counter but by incrementing it they actually mean something different so you get like a collision because these small counter numbers are very easy to collide so one 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 machine has its counter of like four and it means like this way. Another one has four, it means this way. But the best way to like cross check that or build like cryptographic scaffolding around it is to introduce cryptography because cryptographic numbers can't cheat. You know, there's no way that a replica can, can guess it. So either it really knows which way it is or, yep. or it won't. So you can now, like, so like Isaac saying, yeah. yeah, we've got these two numbers. We, we've got the normal number like just a version number that we bump, but we also have the cryptographic hash chain to cross check. Um, yeah, this so protects against forking our log essentially. And so yeah. we don't end up with a situation where the replica, the, the, the truth that our um, cluster agrees on has then become two truths. And so yeah. we, we always keep making sure this, ensure there's only one truth in our, in our system. Um, yeah. And what, yeah, Isaac, cool. do you want to like, That's... what, what was the tricky stuff with the super block? Cause we actually, we made huge changes yesterday. Like yesterday, our super block was yeah. like 1000 megabytes big or something. Um, like, something uh, like that. Yeah. And so, so we now updated our layout here, um, quite significantly, um, to store more stuff, variable length in the trailer. And so, um, you may think like variable length super blocks, how does that work on disc? Well, we're still going to allocate, um, the maximum size on disk for each superblock slot, essentially. 
but we won't spend um or we won't write out the full super block we won't fill out that slot unless our lsm tree is actually like near the maximum hard code capacity limit which we probably will never reach in practice um and so you won't pay the cost of 100 terabytes of metadata or metadata for 100 terabytes of tables and uh, unless you um unless you actually use that much and so what we need to store and what's variable length here is the block free set. Um, this is like kind of the, the bit set of which blocks on in our disk allocation, our local disk allocation, are currently in use. And then we've got the the manifest um, data, which then stores information about um, which tables currently exist and what their keys are, their min and maximum keys, the timestamp, and um, the address address on. Um, the block address of the table index and then the checksum of the table index. Yeah. So the manifest so is kind of, of like, our, like our directory listing. Like the manifest just tells you, look, these are all the tables in the LSM forest. These are their timestamps. They, like, as I said, like the, the metadata, right? And um, so that's yep. also pretty cool. Like while we're doing the compaction, we're creating tables. But until they are referenced by the manifest, again, like we don't, we can just relax. Um, and then at some point we reference them, but it also means we can actually have tables in the manifest. They get compacted, so we like delete them, which we don't we don't do. We just leave them there. But to delete them, we actually just remove them from the manifest, and then that way new queries don't see it, um, but older snapshots that still reference those tables they can still see them although they're not in the manifest. Um, is that right? Uh, exactly, yeah. yeah. Um, yep. And so these two things we now store, instead of putting them, previously we had essentially just two arrays of the maximum manifest count in our super block, but now we switch to a strategy. We store this data just after the end of the super block on disk. So at each super block, each super block like sector on disk or, or section on disk, we will store this super block struct essentially verbatim on disk. Uh, we'll probably rearrange these fields at some point to get rid of padding. We haven't found time for that yet because we haven't written this disk yet. Yeah. But And then that will be followed by then in some order the block free set, um, just the bits, compressed bits of our in-memory bit set of which blocks are free. This is just kind of mapping from address or block address, which is U64 to a Boolean saying whether it's free or not. Um, and then the manifest data will also just be stored after this, um, after the manifest block or the super block on disk, sorry. Um, and we only then write out however much block free set data and manifest data we are currently using in the current LSM tree size, um, which makes snapshotting a lot cheaper for LSM trees that aren't insanely large. Um, yeah. So we saw like, I think there was an issue in level DB where someone was saying, I'm running a very big tree and my manifest is now like multi gigabytes or something huge. Uh, yep. but hope, hopefully like if our like back of the envelope calculations are correct, then like this could actually be addressing a hundred terabytes and the manifests in memory are still going to be just a few hundred megs, like nothing major. Yeah, um, nothing less than a gigabyte yeah. for sure. Yeah, at least that's our that's our hope. Um, yeah, and that's what our calculations show with our current design. So yeah. we haven't actually implemented the in-memory manifest yet, so we don't know for sure. Um, yeah, maybe we'll so we're not some show stoppers today. We'll see. Yeah, um, yeah, this we're gonna get into this. So we're not quite zettabyte scale, but like we're getting there. We're I don't know what. Which, yeah, we're, which the... we're doing pretty well. Um, is anyone data byte scale though? Yeah, which is that? Um, I, miss, I missed you there. It's like petabyte comes after terabyte, then zettabyte. I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so we just need one more order, then we get into the. But I think T is good because it's like Tiger Beetle, so that's good. We're, we're, yeah, we're yeah. Good. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> All right. Um, uh, so how big is the super we get block any now? Like to... We wanted to dig into, or should we move into manifest uh, implementation now? 
Yeah, um, yeah. If anybody's got questions, we haven't had any. Uh, Stephen says, "Great stuff. Can't wait." Like before the break, uh, but we no questions yet. Uh, anybody got some questions? And um, we'll see if we can answer. But how, how big is the super Otherwise, we probably... Sorry. Oh, yeah, that's a good question. We we figured this out yesterday, but I've forgotten the number. We should have written it down, shouldn't we? Um, yeah, yeah. I think we it's only. Yeah. I think it's it's less than the sector size. I remember it being um, about less than two thousand bytes, actually, like something like one thousand five hundred to one thousand seven hundred bytes. Um, yeah. And then we added that was before we added this reserve chunk at the end because we just decided, yeah, we should probably just reserve some memory at the end for future use. And it's fine just adding because as long as we're under a sector here, we've always got to write a full sector at least because we need to do direct I/O. Um, yeah. And so. Being that so under a sector is, is, the, is the real limit. One and then, so if you want to like checkpoint um, to allow the VSR log to wrap around, so basically every halfway through the log or to limit our recovery startup time, we want to just checkpoint the super block, um, then that's going to be just one disk sector that we write to a few versions, and that's it. Uh, well, it's one, it also includes this, this trailer stuff, though. So it's actually probably well, more than a disk sector if we have a large tree. Yeah. But um, yeah. if the tree is small, this stuff will also fit in the same disk sector. Um, yeah. We may want to make this a bit smaller. I'm not sure if we really need that much reserve data. We can kind of come back to that down the yeah. line before we just, like stabilize our on-disk format. We'll, That's still we'll like, probably, a ways off. I think. <laughs> we'll just make yeah. that basically whatever is left in the disk sector. Like We can actually use our like config sector size and... Yeah, well, we could also write the um, like this block preset stuff could also go in the same disk sector as the manifest as the super block there, right? Like we yeah. could just write, we could fill up the rest of the sector with the block preset and the manifest stuff, and then have that spill over into however many sectors are necessary. Yeah. And then we should probably reserve at least some memory here, so we could have like another count and checksum variable if we need yeah. to have like another trailer stuff um, or. Yeah, like we should revisit this when we start thinking about stabilizing the on-disk format and like saying this is like a, yeah. a stable version, which is yeah. not yet. Cool. We've got some questions. Uh, so the first All question right. is a state a statement. Uh, it, I love those questions that are statements. Uh, so guess who it's from, Isaac? Um. Uh, can, you, you know, can I get, do I get to hear the, the statement before I guess, or do I just have to guess? Uh, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll read you the state. I think if I read it to you, then you're going to know who asks this question statement. So I'm sure that if you ask a solution architect from any of the big DB companies, they'll tell you that they are definitely zettabyte scale, that they have the best fault model, etc. smiley face. Uh, hmm. uh, it must be Loris. Exactly. Yeah. Thanks, Loris. And Loris actually says, haha, I didn't mean for it to be a question, but there you, there you go. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so what's the answer to that? Like when they say that, like, how do you answer that? Um, um, yes, do you say you want to see like the test of are they actually running this in practice? Or like, yeah. is there anyone actually using this at a bit scale? Um, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe you could ask to see like the tests. Like, do they test the fault model? Because if it's not tested, it's not there. Like, uh, yeah, I think that, that that's the that's the real question. Is like, do they? How how do you inject storage faults in your tests? That'd be like the if they say we don't do that, then you know. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, and then second question from Nipsey: Isn't the size influenced by the config? Uh, i.e. like clients max, shouldn't the reserved bits be influenced by that as well? Uh, the reserved bits in the super block, I think, if I understand the, the question. Yeah, um, so it could just be, well, yeah, so that's a good, that's point. A good point. We do currently, yeah, yeah, yeah. We current, our on-disk layout is currently dependent on the config on some config options. And so we need to decide how we handle that once we start thinking about stabilizing the on-disk layout. We could just make, we could just say that you can't change this config option or make the config um, more or less of a, a thing that's targeted at users and more of just like a, 
a constants file. Um, yeah, that's a good long. That's, that's more of a long term like design question of whether we want to make this stuff configurable or just say we know best. We should just make hard code the stuff and the thing we make think makes oh. the most sense. Or, um, or we we know worst or uh, <laughs> no yeah. Worst. <laughs> Yeah, the yeah. So this this that's a great question. The, this config file actually is kind of like our low level comp time constants. So ba basically, yeah. you can use this config to create any kind of distributed database, and then everything just like adjusts yeah. using Zig's comp time. So, yeah. I think this is not the, part of Tiger Bill's API, really. This is more of just no. like a some some this of this is, this is not present. user end user. Input. Yeah, so um, some some of this is present. We're kind of like taking a shortcut just to make it easier to bootstrap. But the the stuff at the yeah. top is like runtime config that'll change, like ports and addresses. Um, yeah. But then a this lot stuff, of a lot of it is kind of like binary specific. So that 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 would change. Yeah. yeah. There's definitely some there's some like um, cleanup that needs to happen here before we stabilize the yeah. undisk format for sure. And this stuff yeah. should not be in the config. This should be like a command line parameter essentially with also like yeah. a scope as well probably. Yeah. Re replicas max and clients max those are um comp time that, that that would be like just we would set that reasonably high um, so yep. at at current at present replicas max actually is going to go up above six but for the bounty we've set it to six so that the vopper like doesn't use too much memory on people's machines um i think yep. um but and then further down, like, do you want to jump down in the config a little while we're here? Um, sure. What do you want to look at? Like message size max. We've got connections yeah. max for the message bus. Um, got some TCP stuff. Um, yeah. Jitter. Like, um, like, uh, yep. We've got sector size, size, direct I/O. Yeah. Cache line size. Yep. Size of a CPU cache line and bytes. Yeah. Um, and that'll actually like impact the LSM license. layouts. So if you if you change these, then Indeed. everything just adjusts. Um, yep. And so we can then maybe we want like a Tiger Build 2.0 to have a 128 byte cache lines. If like every CPU uses that in 10 years time, um, yeah. then we can adjust that here. Um, yeah. As soon as Cocoon is running on a Mac. Uh, does Cocoon run on a Mac? <laughs> um, I think so, yeah. I don't think it, I, it doesn't run on Windows, but I think it runs fine on yeah. anything vaguely Unix-like. Um, yeah. Uh, cool. You run it on Windows, no, it's got, it's like, there's like some like MinGW thing to, um, yeah. to uh, like emulate Unix on Windows, but like, let's not get into that right now. Um, yeah. Nip Nipsey answers. He says it does on Mac. Uh, yeah. It does. Nice. Well, it's it's got it. Like of course. Of course it does. Yeah. Um, do we have any other questions, or should we get into the implementation now? Yeah, I think we're ready. Cool. Um, I'm gonna switch off this aircon. I'll be back in a second. Cool. All right. So basically we need to sketch out like our actual working manifest data structure to help us out. Um, exactly, yeah. yeah. So we have like the the very start of it here, but this probably needs to change. Like we only have one field and it's probably wrong. Um, yeah. So that's also well, relates to on disk format though, because I'm... Hmm? Oh, sorry, I was going to go to you. Like the on disk format, I'm not sure how we um how we're storing like what level each table is on the manifest right now. So here we just have um or what we're, we're, we're planning on having right now is just a straight plot or a straight array of manifest of table infos essentially. Then there's nothing relating to the disk or the the LSM level of each table. Like we need to in memory have some mapping of in the manifest of LSM levels to tables because we, we need to be able to say like get me all the tables at this level in this key range um, yeah. for compaction for example. Um, Are we currently um, uh, like in our VS because 
basically each table it's got the index block the index block has got a header which is also our vsr header so right um, um in our header we're not storing the level because we need to do that like you say you but probably should also, yeah yeah so we need to store level yes, we... stamp uh, so is the level something that we need to add to, to, to table info you think or should we store yeah. that somehow out of band um because that's gonna be the same for like many tables so we could also here in like our manifest blocks for each manifest block or well no that probably wouldn't work we could, we could also just like store maybe like here um like how many manifest blocks are at each level for each lsm tree and store that out of band that'd be a lot less data than to write to disk yeah um maybe we should work out the in-memory representation first though, and then come back That's to the this representation yeah, we don't yeah. have to worry about Superblock yet. And maybe, like, we don't have to go to compaction and update that yet to put the level into the header. We can just say, like, we need to do that, and then we'll go and do it. So if we can do that, if that, if that becomes the right way to do things, we should just focus on yeah. this this data structure first. And we, so what are, we, what are we trying to optimize I for think, here? I think we should we should store the level in the header anyway, because then we, we've just got it stored in, as a cross-check, you know? We just kind of like to cross-check stuff. Um, yeah, but we don't have to do it yet. That sounds so reasonable, maybe, yeah. Now we're just going to sketch out like the API for this. Like, what do we, I thought we could, we could sort of see how do we reference the manifest so far and what methods do we need? Because the one trick it, like for this is basically this is like our manifest versions struct. Like, so you can pass in yeah. a, a snapshot timestamp and get the manifest for that version. Is that what we think? Yeah, or do we just want to have all the query functions take a timestamp as well? Um, it, it, yeah, yeah, that's it. Guess, um, may, and then we only have like one actual manifest in memory. I think that's probably yeah. more of the API we want. Um, yeah. And so we have here some to do's, or this is the main to do. Returns true if all remaining values in the level have been buffered. This is on level iterator. And so we just have a to-do look at the manifest to determine this. Um, yeah. And so we also have a to-do here to get the next. Um, we have here manifest that get next um, table. Um, yeah. Shall we look at this one? Somewhere. Um, it, it's kind of like we want, we want to pass in here the current address or the current table. Yep. We want we want to pass in the current level as well. Um, yeah, we need the level. We need the. I think we just need the level and the key min, and then it'll turn us the and the and the key max. I think is what we want to pass into this. And then, as we go through the tables, we can update like the current key min of the level iterator. And the manifest yeah. function, we could then take just like level key min and key max and then return the lowest table yeah. or the highest table in that range, depending on which order we tell it. Um, yeah, because we, we do want to do key min and max so that our iterator can be multi directional. Right. So that's and what so I think that's, yeah. that's only a good API. Um, yeah. This could be good if here, then um, level table seems. I'm going to go delete this stuff. That doesn't seem yeah. like the right way to go for now. Um, let's just get the functions done or functions we need. And then we can, that will then inform our data restore. Um, yeah. So, so we want like, this was and, and that's going to return table info. Like that's all we need. Most of these are just returning exactly, table info. Yeah. yeah. So like next table. Yeah. Next table, and this if we'll take a. Typing is not for level. Levels can be just a U8, probably. Um, yeah. Then we need yeah. um, key min, key max. And a direction. Yeah. 
Well, how do we want to do that? Like, we also have like two functions for like highest table and lowest table. It seems like it's slightly nicer. And maybe that's maybe we yeah, want to have a direction thing here. That's what the that's what like level did in that. They've got previous next, and you end up with a whole lot of different code paths. But I was thinking if we just had one function to call, and you switch your direction all the way through, then you're it's like less branchy, you know. It's just a bit interesting because yep. now key min and key max, you know. But we can then handle that internally here, based on direction, like so that it's fine. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, because I think the level iterator stores the, the current key then, and then it, yeah. So like if we if I'm we were how like doing range queries, like I'm not sure if range queries will use level iterator. So I think they need to go across m multiple levels, right? Um, like not all um, the, yeah, they need to traverse they, multiple levels at once. Yeah, they're gonna do all the levels at once. Um, but within a level, they, they'll use level iterator. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. So we'll we'll have level iterators, and then we'll, we'll go across all of them, and, then we, and yeah. we're going to do like a horizontal or vertical K-way merge across all of them yeah. to just find the earliest. It's going to be pretty cool, because we can use K-way merge vertically like that, or horizontally like we use it currently. Like, yeah. Well, I don't, I don't know which is which, which is horizontal, yeah. vertical. Oh. Yeah, yeah, I feel like, yeah, I know what you mean though. <laughs> yeah. Cool, that makes sense. And so we can, on level iterator, we can just like store the the current key without saying whether it's the minimum or maximum. Well, no, that doesn't really work then. Um, hmm. We can just, um, so, uh, Are you thinking like the trick, the challenge here is, do we only provide a single key argument to your next table? Because if that's the case, yeah. then the direction makes less sense. Maybe we also, yeah, I'm also kind of wondering if we just want to like, instead of having this API, we just like fill up a, a buffer with um, 10 table infos and limit it to then, like we just query, say like, get all the tables in this range at this level and then level iterator can just like have a buffer of 10 table infos that it has just builds up from the manifest function at, at initialization. That's maybe yeah. a lot simpler. Um, I think so it's the, then like requires the, you to all at once then. So then then yeah. it doesn't work for more than 10 tables because then we're, if we're compaction, we're limited to 10 tables, but that's not the case for range queries. Yeah, and we, we kind of want this method to be very low level just to do, a, it's basically you want to just find the next table according to the direction. Um, and, yeah. and then how it gets used can be done higher up. Because so we, maybe we just take one key argument here then, and then the caller needs to compare it with a key max or key min if it's going the other, like to see the yeah. uh, range. I think we should do both because like for What's nice with key min key max is like in our compaction stuff, you literally just pass in the table info of key min key max. So you, you don't have to then do that branch at the call site. You just pass in both. And then in this function, according to the direction, it's going to choose what to use. But that, that way, wherever we use this, we depend. don't. Yeah, that's fine. I guess that, yeah. So that in the um, level iterator, we just keep track of both key min and key max for the current level, and then we just update yeah. one of them based on the direction. Yeah, that, make, that makes sense. Cool. Yeah. But this is the right API then, I think. And we're going to return a table info. Yeah. By copy. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Or, well, we could return a pointer as well. I was actually thinking we probably want to store these as like a start of arrays in memory, because um, that will make it cheaper to like search based on the key min and key max if we store these like, um, yeah, yeah, separately. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like we want to make yeah. it pretty cheap. We want to optimize for like binary search on key min and key max. I think to find like the yeah. position in the manifest where. And so if we store these in a separate array than this stuff, then yeah, 
Anyhow. And then when so that's when one we function. When we checkpoint the super block, are we just going to then merge across all those um, columns? We checkpoint the super block. We're going to not because there there we store in the you know for the manifest blocks we're going to store table infos. Yeah, I think we might want to update how we store the manifest on disk based on how we store it in memory. We can make yeah. it. I think we want to figure out the in-memory format first, and then if we make it, I think it may just emerge, a nice on-disk layout may emerge from the in-memory format. Um, yeah. I think we want to optimize for the in-memory query speed, because that'll be like our main bottleneck for like lookups, I think is the CPU cost of yeah. looking through manifest and then table um, doing that binary search or Heitzinger search. Yeah. And we, I was just wondering, like, is it, so we're thinking struct of arrays, is that, if I got it right, I always get confused which yeah. one it is. Yeah. Struct of so arrays, we, yeah. We're only going to really search on the keys for those. We're not going to do that for timestamps, maybe, or address, or checks. Right. <laughs> but we want to do it anyway that way, because otherwise we're going to be duped duplicating the key storage, which will increase the memory overhead. So. Yeah, yeah. Or we could just do like a, we'd also just do like a, a, well, I'm not even sure what the right way to do this is, because we've got a key min and a key max we need for each table. We probably just yeah. put this in separate arrays. And then the rest of the stuff, we it's probably also simplest just to just use the same pattern for the other fields. So we could yeah. um, like put the checksum address and timestamp together in the same array. I'm not sure there'd be a real point in that. Um, no. No, but we definitely don't want to duplicate the keys into us. Because at first I was thinking we would just store all the table infos and then we duplicate the keys into a contiguous area. But we may as well just extract all the arrays. Yeah. 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 Cool. And yeah. then, and so the main question that I'm worrying about is how we like store the levels, the level information. Like we had this like level arrays thing here where we just had like a, an array of um, like level max or whatever it was. Um, we, we do know, like we do have a config for that. So we can set that and let's say LSM levels max. That's yep. cool. It's just alpha some levels is what it is. Yeah. Yep. And then we have here then um, level. I don't know what to call it aside from that. And here nice. That's pretty cool. Like, Something like that. Oh. Um, a compiler for something, but what I don't know what I've done. Um, yeah, that's good now. ZLS just took a minute to update, I guess. Hey, um, Loris is saying you can even run Cocoon on Windows with WSL. Yeah. With X11 apps. So yeah. Cocoon is universal. <laughs> well, you're running, if you're running it on the Windows Linux emulator. <laughs> Um, yeah, I'm not yeah. sure I'd count that as running on Windows, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> cool. <laughs> yeah, so level. Um, that this is yeah, this is pretty nice. Like once you break the manifest down into levels, like it's, it's just like it, it help, makes it much more approachable, you know. And then we have what like a well the the tricky part here is probably memory management because we want to have these buffers able to grow and shrink. Um. Like now, what also... we end up here is like, is like we have then here like a key, key or min key keys or key mins. I guess yeah. it's key mins is right. Then it's just like a slice of keys. But where is that memory? Or who owns that memory? And how does it get like resized when yeah. the number of keys and uh, tables in the manifest level changes? And the, um, the challenge is also that this is per this is per LSM. And or per tree, and and we don't know the split between trees in the forest. Exactly. So we had an idea where we would like have like one, essentially like one allocation, um, that's then divided up between the LSM trees. Um, we we know the ratio between some of them. We also only have accounts and transfers now. So basically, we just need to figure out the ratio of accounts to transfers, and know how we should divide up our memory. 
between the LSM trees. So the biggest issue yeah. of like index LSM tree size to transfer LSM tree size, like transfers in transfer indexes and to transfer themselves is always a fixed ratio. It's always just one to one yeah. for every yeah. the transfers LSM and then all the different indexes. The ratio yeah. is just between the, the transfers we, we LSM to... and all the indexes. Yeah. Okay, so we have like one buffer. We just need to like decide where or what ratio between of this buffer should go to each each um, manifest. Yeah. Hey, um, Larissa's says ciao. Yeah. Cool. See you, Larissa. Cool. Yeah. Um, so. That was pretty cool because we kind of solved it. Now we must just remember how we solved it. Um, you know, well, we solved it, but not really. We like, we know how to, we could divide up the memory in total, but it becomes trickier when we're then like now dividing up even smaller slices of that memory in for the yeah. keys, keys and timestamps and checksums and addresses and whatnot. So, but I guess that's fine. Maybe we just take a buffer on on a knit here, and then we these slices all go into that same buffer. Yeah. Or something like that. Yeah. Just trying to figure, like, figure out how to make this like, as simple as possible. Um, yeah, th this idea was basically where we have one single buff, big buffer allocated for the whole forest. Then what we do yep. is we divide divide this up across thirty LSMs, thirty trees equally. They each get their own right. allocation, and then if they need more we steal from the neighbors or otherwise if it, if it has to we actually just do a mem copy and we even worked out in right. excel that like the cost of that mem copy we we even solved that that this yeah, is going to be like we one or two also, milliseconds yeah, that, 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 uh, i'm with you there except we actually don't need to divide into 30 just into two because we only have two yeah. um we basically have two groups of lsms which always grow in sync with each other Inside yeah. the group, I mean, for like the accounts and the transfers, and then their indexes, respectively. And so it's just the ratio of accounts L, accounts to transfers in our storage. Yeah. Um, Although maybe we we shouldn't depend on that for correctness because we might want to decide at runtime if we want to add indexes or not. Like we might we might be adding. Um, for for example, there's one index we. I thought we, like a virtual index, i.e. like on a transfer. So at present, like every field of the transfer struct, um, you know, like the ID, the amount of the transfer, the debit credit accounts, those fields, they we have one to one, you know, an index for each of them. But to yeah. do the two-phase commit timeouts for the transfers, we actually want to create like a virtual index where we take the timeout field plus the timestamp field, add them together, and that'll give us an index into the future when that transfer expires. Mm. But that's kind of like, that, that isn't runtime, so we can count on that. But I, I think maybe for this, we don't want the design to, to force those relationships between LSMs. Maybe like other, other people using this would want to do you know that the, the whether where like at runtime based on an object they'll decide if they want indexes or not so the ratios might not always be there okay um not totally convinced um i think we should design for our use case first um because I, 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 yeah. like you can't like decide at runtime to index an lsm that would just be like a huge latency spike then like backfill the index for all the data you already have in your LSM tree. It'd have to be like a, a config on startup, essentially, I think. Yeah, I, I just We're don't think we need it. it. To me, it seems like an optimization thing, not a correctness thing. So we can make the correctness bar low. So we don't, we don't require it as part of the design that your LSMs have to have a fixed ratio between them. That would be easier. Like I think it would actually make the code much simpler if but, we didn't well, require I'm, that. I'm not saying that the ratio should be fixed. I'm just saying that mm. um, there we end up with two groups of LSMs, which then have a fixed ratio between them. But then between those two groups, it's a, it's a variable ratio. It would then adjust yeah. based on what the actual usage pattern is. Yeah, um, I, th I think it should be more general even than that. Uh, it's a good idea, but I think we, sh we shouldn't depend on that. 
All right. Because we reason. can. I mean, we we could do it for us so that we optimize for that, but but we we should we can just make that like that allocator that it steals and we do the main copies to fix it up. Um, what what we could do is we could sort LSM so that like when you set it up like set up the forest, you can put the big LSMs first or the small ones all in one, and and then everything works off that. Just it, it, it's an optimization. Like big and small not, there. Uh, like so we go like going back to our remember we did it on the, on the whiteboard. Size, I guess. No, um, it could be, but like basically, you know, the, our whiteboard idea for how we allocate the memory for the manifest, we we're just gonna give them right, all yeah. zones, and we. But I you don't we know how just, big the just do that at startup. Um, no, no, that's fine. But we we just give them all an equal amount, and as it as the ratio changes, we just adjust and do the main copy, if necessary. But we don't yeah. we don't have to for yeah. I think mean, that's not really the problem we're dealing with right now, though. The problem I was kind of thinking about is like how we then take that single buffer we get for the manifest memory and split that up then into um, buffers for different levels. Uh, oh yeah, but but also for different LSMs, right? Uh, 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 are you thinking well, of the next? Assuming, oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm I was assuming thinking, that we're we're, like, we're going to get a buffer yeah. for this LSM at some point somehow. Yeah. We'll have some yeah. fixed uh, okay. this, this memory. We'll have some way yeah. to respond when we run out of memory there, which then either okay. gets us more memory or says the cluster needs to shut down because we're out of space. Um, okay, cool. Uh, okay, great. So now I understand. So we we um, so this this tree has now got its buffer, and we've got a way to grow that buffer, which we don't need to think about now. So. Yeah. Now we like like you say like now we're putting the levels across this, yep. um, and we know the relationship between the levels because each level is ten times bigger than the previous, and it won't be more. It'll be at most ten times bigger. Okay, so we got the limit of level size then. So then we can we can just divide this up, so that we don't even need yep. to store the slices then perhaps. Um, if we know the ratio between the levels, we know like then. A compile time where each level starts inside this larger buffer. Yeah. Yeah, and the the one trick comes in where this buffer as a whole is now too small. Now we have to redo everything across the. A, a, another solution. Yeah is actually to say each tree, because we across the forest, we know that we have up to seven levels. We can actually say to each tree, OK, you get a buffer for level zero, you get a buffer for level one, you get a buffer for level, and you can grow or shrink those independently. So rather than having one okay. big buffer, putting all the levels into that, you you have like, because uh, that, that'll make it simpler. We're just using an allocator here. Um... <laughs> Like that's that's now we're, we're definitely getting to, into just like territory of just implementing an allocator essentially. Um, exactly, but but just the the that's fine. It it is, but the the memory backing the allocator is statically allocated up front. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So basically, like the the buffer we for the tree um, for all the levels. Each level has its own buffer. It's a totally separate allocation. Does that? Yeah, that 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 would work, I guess. Um, but I was trying to figure out if there's a way to do this efficiently with an allocator, like. What do we do to make space here? Um, and if you like move one level, then you got like potentially like. Mem copy like a whole bunch of data for across all the trees. One level gets too large. Um, yeah, yeah. I but at least it's only think, it's only for I that level, not across all the levels. Uh, I think exploiting the fixed ratios we know about at compile time is really important to make this fast and avoid unnecessary reallocation. Um, 
Yeah, but we can't we can't guarantee that. Like we don't know if that's always possible, even for us. I'm talking about the ratio uh, between levels um, inside the tree. Uh, 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 okay, well that 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 we know. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I thought I thought we were back to the trees. Oh, good. Um, cool. Yeah. Or can we maybe just like, um, hmm. and so this manifest also needs to like store, like, we, have, we also have this idea of like positive and negative manifests, right? We also need to store that in memory somehow. Um, yeah. That probably informs how this stuff works as well. Um, yeah. That will be, that will be, be more related to how we do like resizing when we like delete a table from the manifest. We don't really delete it. We just add it to the negative manifest, um, at least temporarily. And then yeah. we can kind of maybe amortize the resizes more because of that fact. I'm not sure. Um, can you help me? Can I, can you explain it to one more time to me? Um, I'm still not totally sure how positive and negative manifests work in practice. That's yeah. like an idea that we had to solve just snapshots essentially. Yeah. Um, we say like positive manifest block spells is M1 and then ne negative manifest block spells M1. Um, so I think the idea is that positive that manifests basically... always. Yeah, sorry, Isaac. Uh, that was basic, like positive negative manifests. That was our way that when a table gets deleted through compaction, it goes into the negative manifest so that it's no longer part. The active manifest is a function of positive manifests, less negative manifests. But yep. the snapshots can still look into the negative manifests to see what they need to see. But that was also more like right. our, that the positive negative was more about our on disk format, not necessarily our in memory format. Well, I think we need the same thing in memory though, or we need multiple manifest versions per snapshot. We either need, we need one of those two things. We either need to have one manifest with the positive and negative information, which you can pass in a timestamp to the query functions that like say what snapshot you're querying at. Yeah. Or we need, um, like a separate manifest for each snapshot in memory, which seems like it'd be less efficient, probably. Yeah. You definitely use more memory. I'm not sure about query speed. Query speed could be better. Yeah. I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, I've I've got an idea. Like uh, in next, maybe we can like go back to next table, and okay. just talk there, and maybe that'll help us out. So, like we actually probably need another argument here. If we want um, snapshot. Oh yeah, of course. Um, this probably come first then. And we, we're not going to use an optional there. We are just always going to pass a snapshot. So if, if the query is on the active manifest, we'll just pass like a Sentinel, very high value. Yep. Just like max int essentially. Yeah. Yeah. So there's no branching. So this is kind of like. We can use this for compaction. We can use this for reads and for range queries. This is the only function we need. Yeah, I guess so. And in a way, um, Like, what do you think if, like, instead of calling it next table, we just call it like get table? So sure, we're basically just um, saying like for this level and these key ranges, get the first table that overlaps. Yeah, get the first table in this direction. We, we do like need the direction. Sending or descending, yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. And then, really like, the only in... function we need. Yeah, I think it is exactly. Um... Yeah, and then in like the compaction iterator, we, if we want to get the next table, um, then and we, we update tweak... to be yeah. the, 
the key max of the table that was just returned and go on from there. Yeah. Yeah. The only problem with that is that key max is inclusive. So if we pass key max in as key min, we will get the same table returned again, not the next one. And we don't have a function to yeah. generate, to increment keys, you know? Otherwise, we need another. Well, yeah, we need that, or can we like get around that somehow? Yeah. Um, so may maybe we should still call this next table. And if a read comes in, we basically pass in key min, key max. But, but you see, yeah, the next table is going to return the thing off. So maybe we need two functions then, like get table and next table. What's the difference between them then? They just do the, the bound, the, when they do the comp key comparison, they use different bounds. The one will do like less than or equal to, and the other one will do greater than. Okay. I'm still not quite following why we need to. Yeah. So, so if, if we say we like, we want to look up key one, two, three. All right. We just, we just doing a point lookup. Then we're going to set key min to one, two, three and key max to one, two, three. Yep. Uh, direction doesn't matter because it's a point lookup. Then we want to find the table where key min is greater than or equal to one, two, three. And where key max is less than or equal to one, two, three. That'll, that'll satisfy the point lookup. When we do the compaction iterator though, it's different because there key min and key max are the key are the values of the table we've just finished. Yeah. So mm. depending on direction, we're only going to use either key min or key max inside this function. Um, but but what we want to do two then, functions then really two functions. That's what I'm. That's by the implementation. Yeah. yeah. We can always but come back later be, and see if we can combine. I think it should be. Um, I think, I think I think I think we're thinking about different things though. I think we should have we should get rid of the direction argument. And then have get um, or next table or next get or get table min and get table max I guess um, and only have pass in one key. Um, I don't I don't think we must well, do that because um, then then our call site becomes more complicated. We we want to keep the direction for range queries and compaction. I'm not sure it does become more complicated. Um, but I think it's hard to say, do that without writing the code in the call site as well. Um, yeah. We're just we making this API as simple as possible. Um, get table. So this one, we just then look for the table, the next, the table um, at this level that might contain this key and there'll be no overlap or well, at level zero that there, there might be overlap. Um, then we'd have to return multiple tables and what do we do then? Um, yeah, yeah, that's a good question too. Um, I think we, we, yeah, like, okay, get table. Maybe we should like return an iterator of sorts where we initialize the iterator with the key, with a key min and key max, and then returns all the tables matching that query. Exactly. That's it. And the, and the and iterator yeah, that has works a di zero. direction. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And then, the, then, then, um, at level zero, we just return all the overlapping tables as well. Um, that's yeah. no problem then with that API. I think we just we need cool. to return more than one table here. We also yeah. don't want to um, we don't want to return like a slice of tables because it could be like unbounded and we want to use them incrementally. Um, yeah. So I think that's the the right API is an iterator here. I think let's kind yeah, of sketch out the iterator awesome. API now. <laughs> yeah, nice. This is cool. Yeah. Well, actually, let's just do the iterator. 
straight up. Um, this is now also, I, I want to call this like level iterator as well, but yeah. um, is that okay? Uh, we already have a level iterator. Uh, uh, let, what, what do you think of level info or le level table info iterator? You also just call it, leave it as manifest.iterator and it iterates at yeah. one level. I think that that's maybe fine for you. Um, I think we'll we'll probably want to still have iterator because when we're doing super block, we'll want to iter iterate across all the table infos in the manifest. So this it's good. I think like this is level table info iterator, like just something specific. Level table info iterator. Why I'm not? Why can't it just be iterator though? We said manifest uh, iterator. Because this this one only goes across a level. Um, when we do. Yeah. The super block we we're gonna want it. Yeah, oh, well, I think we the can super actually... block will just do something different. Um, what, okay. was your, what, was, what was your thought? No, okay, let's leave it as iterator then. Um, then we see if we change it. Cool. I think we should leave it as this until we have a name conflict inside inside manifest for a different iterator type. Yeah. Then we can figure out what distinguishes them and do the name based on that. Yeah, um, the, the only thing is that the, this looks like you're iterating all the table infos in the manifest, but you're actually only iterating right. one level. But so I think level iterator is better here, yeah. and it's in the manifest namespace. Um, okay. it's, just going, it's just going across a, a level, that's all. You'll need a, a level to initialize this iterator, though, so it'll be clear that you're iterating over just one level, I think. Um, yeah. Is is our other level iterator? That's in our table namespace, or um, that's just in the LSM tree namespace currently. Yeah. Um, okay, let let's keep going. Cool. This will just be next. Which will take a return an optional table info. And the knit is the real question, though. Yep. This will then take, I guess, um, we'll manifest pointer first. Well, maybe it should be a function of manifest, actually. That's the usual pattern. So, like, Oops, sorry, my stream, or, my stream got lost just a second. Um, I don't, know. I don't know what's happened to Discord. Uh, let's quickly check. Where did Discord go? It's interesting. Pop out again. There we go. It's back. Cool. Great. <laughs> Nipsey says it works again. <laughs> Thanks. Cool. Yeah. We're back up. All right. And so I think we should just call this one can get tables then and it returns an iterator. Um, and it takes the same thing, key min, key max. And also the direction. We actually need to define here, I think. Um, yeah. Can we do, or can we just hoist it so that it's shared? I use the same one for everything here, probably. Yeah. yeah. I think it's in Kway right now, right? Kway. Yeah. I think it's in the LSM file, I guess. This yeah. can just. Maybe like I don't know where to put this even. Does it really just belong here in LSM tree? And then Kway can you like import? Hmm. You can do that. Yep. Vlas is not being very fast to catch up. Um. All right, and here we've got the direction. 
iterator. And now we'll initialize this thing. We need to store, no, we need to store here. I think we need to store the manifest, first of all. Maybe we can store less of it at, at some point, but I'm not sure about that. We need like the current key min, the current key max. And we've got the same problem, like how to implement this iterator now with like the key min, key max less than or equal to stuff, perhaps. But maybe yeah. not. Um, yeah. Like we're gonna, we're gonna return one table info, then we need to increment key max. Maybe we just need to like key, store like which table info we returned last, or like which table address we returned last, and then compare that to see if it's if it's the same. If we already returned it, then we move on to the next one. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. Cool. And based on the direction, we'll either use key min or key max. Yeah. And we'll need snapshot in here as well. Oh yeah. And level as well. Great. Direction actually is the same order. It's all the same yeah. stuff really. And then yeah. we're gonna return um, I can just use this syntax and yeah, just grab this stuff, I guess. All right. Nice multi-selection there. Thank you. Um, uh, yeah. So now next is the really the question is what how we do this. This is like the, the meat of it now. Um, yeah. This also depends on how our manifest is laid out, of course. But maybe we should just kind of think about how we use key min and key max now for now. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we're gonna need because then that will kind of determine what what kind of queries the manifest struct itself will need support. It's like how we then query key min and key max here. Yeah. Um, exactly. Like we kind of back to back to the problem now again. We all just yeah. go in circles because. And so now, yeah. Um, yeah. So we're gonna kind of say. Well, the first thing we, need, we want to do is check if we're done somehow. So, I think, well, I think we just query, um, just like route pseudocode, maybe like manifest. Cool. Get next a hole or Maybe let's just write out comments for the pseudocode for now. So we yeah. want to we want to first check if um let's just, for this comments let's assume direction assume direction is ascending just for the comments. Yeah. Um, um assume direction is ascending. Um, check or search or key min or the current. Key man and the mana manifest um, given level and snap shot. Um, that's kind of the core search algorithm. And then if we find, if we get the table, if this returns a table info. Uh, I think I've got it. Uh, oh yeah? Or, or have you, have you got it and are you? Are you writing it out, or like have you already got it and writing it out, or, or am I just catching up? Or I'm not I, sure. Have I, I think you should explain what you, what you've got. Okay. Um, so I think what it is is like what uh, the problem I've been thinking of is we already we've already our iterator has already returned say say we've already returned the first table info. Um, I mean, maybe you've had this long ago, right? 
<laughs> but, okay, Maybe. So, so bear, bear with me. So we've we've returned the first table info for the level. Now we want to get the next one. So key min and key max are set to the table we've just returned. Yep. Because direction is ascending order, we're going to have a, a branch. Um, because we're going in descending order, now what we need to do is look for the table in the man, in the level that's within the, the snapshot that, that the snapshot can see. That's but that's so obvious. Um, and find the first table where key min is greater than key max. The, the key min of that table is greater than key max of the table we've just returned. And that's okay. That's then the next table. That's the next table. That's then the next table. And if, okay. if direction is descending, then um, in the branch for that, we're going to say, um, look for the table where key max is less than key min. Um, yep, so we want to like go yeah. you see one past the table we just returned to find that like the next table will be returning. Exactly, and then yeah. set key min to that table's key min. Or do yeah. we just store that table? I feel like it might be more efficient if we like actually end up storing a pointer into the manifest structure. Um, yeah. And like keep the that current sorted. table we're at. Yeah. yeah. I think that actually ended up being better than this probably because Yeah. Um I think we just on a on a net we, we like look use key min to find the start index in the manifest at this level. And yeah. then um for the further iterations, we just we don't need to do another binary search in the manifest to find key min. We don't need wasteful. to do more comparisons. Instead, we just yeah. we just increment this this index, check if the snapshot and level are okay. Or we'll check if the snapshot's okay. And then if if it is, then increment it. if it's not, then increment it again to look at the next one. Yeah. Until we go yeah. past key max or the end. Um yeah. that's much better. Cool. That's not what I that's not what I was writing out there. I, I I was like a few steps behind, but now we've, we've like built off each other to get to the to get to the point. Um, nice. Yeah. It's like bouldering, right? Uh, we just uh, leapfrogging. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Everyone like figures out the next little step of the problem, and then yeah. Yeah. Chip chip something in, and then okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cool. All right. So we need yeah. to start here now, like an index into the manifest. Um, so key main, you only need to initialize this actually. Um, we don't actually need to store mm -hmm. it in the iterator. We just need to store the index. Exactly. And the we direction. We store the index of the initial one and the direction and the key max we need to know when, when to stop. So we maybe like store like stop key here. Um, but maybe, maybe we should, but so let's, let's figure out what we need for the manifest to supply with us with. We need like a way to search to find the table um, that contains a given key, or might contain a given, or the, the, the first ta the, the table in a level that might contain a given key. Um, yeah. Or no, we want to return the table on one. So it's either the table that might contain this key, or if no table contains that key, then the table either immediately greater or larger or smaller than this key, right? Yeah, yeah, for like for range queries and stuff. Uh, for the iterator. This iterator, I think, is only for range queries. Otherwise, we just want to have a, a we want to get we want a point lookup function. I think first that should be what we do first, and then range queries we can, we we've, we've just realized we can build on top of that using the index stuff. And I think yeah, we, and, what we want and, first is just a point lookup. Yeah, um, and re, re, we'll use that iterator for range queries and for compaction. Um, exactly. Yeah. So it's going to be the same stuff here, except there's only one key argument. There's no direction. Yeah. And then we have the iterator for compaction. Um, this will turn yeah. an optional table info if none is found. Yeah. Let's see, make this probably. Does that fit on one line? I think it. Oh, no, it doesn't really. That's too bad. Okay, back to this. <laughs> um, you know, um, Isaac, what do you think? Like, um, are we going to call it range queries or are we going to call it scans? Good question. Um, I haven't given it much thought. Okay, because 
um, everybody calls it range queries. Some, some call it like a scan, but what you could do is you could have get table, like get is your point lookup and scan is your, so get table and scan tables. Uh, yeah, but yeah, maybe that, it, that isn't, um, but I, yeah, hmm. this doesn't matter for now. It's just an idea. Uh, I just maybe we want to stick with, by, sorry. Oh uh, no. Yeah. I'm not, I don't have any strong feelings either way there, to be honest. Um, yeah. Okay. I think so. I think yeah, we got this kind on. of down there. We, let's yeah. implement um, let's implement the iterator real quick on top of get table. So say, say, let's just assume we have this function done, and just yeah. make sure we can implement this and it works out. Um, yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. And get table key min is actually just going to be key there, uh, not key min, right? Oh yeah, of course. Yeah. And then iterator. I think when we initialize it, um, we're going to actually have like a start and index here. I'm just going to make it, um, let's see, so end key, or just call, we can just call it end and have it, the type be key. Um, index, we got u32, I think. Um, um, we, we can call it sentinel. Um, instead of end? Yeah. Or what? Uh, it's the think, mm, term, I don't think terminal that's, key. I think that's the proper use of the sentinel. Yeah. I think sentinel's okay. like a special key, but that's not a normal key. This is a normal key, just the normal one key, yeah. the key that we stop searching after. Um, okay. And index, this is not probably the right type, but we can just use this for the logic for now. It's going to be the same logic roughly. Um, but we can change this type once we implement the manifest data structure, perhaps. Um, and so first thing we're going to do is just like, um, when we do, maybe we want an initialization function here. I'm not sure now. Yeah. Um, we I want think to we like, do. Uh, I think, I think what we want to do is call the point lookup and actually our point lookup one, we want it to return, not a table info. We want it to return a table index, uh, so that we Our can then use index. that. Exactly. Yeah. It, it, basically, Maybe it's index. Have... It, it's like a level index, a uh, level table index. Maybe we have this, actually. We have like get table internal. It's not public. That then returns the index. And this one just converts it to a table info before returning it. Exactly. That's And then the internal one can be used by the iterator. Exactly. And this is just, this calls. Yeah. Um, manifest, I get table internal, um, snap shot level yeah. key. I think, and then we I think have we here, just, um, just call it table index. Get table index instead of get table internal. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. They're good. Cause it, it's literally I don't like, like the index, index it's overloaded there. Cause in tables also have index blocks. <laughs> Um, yeah, but you see, even in the iterator, we call it index. Uh, but maybe, maybe what we must do is before we think, like, I, I, maybe we, like we can we can think of like the memory layout for the the level, because, and maybe we maybe we already know enough, like the, so like let's say we like level one we can basically yep. just have like all the table infos and we're going to have them keep them sorted um sorted like yeah in key min key max order and if we're doing descending then get table index is going to start at the end or it's going to start at the beginning um based on direction and then yep but basically, like we want that memory just to be contiguous. We want it to be already sorted, because that way, once you've got right. an index into the level, you can just move your cursor left or right. It's we Indeed. can call it yeah. cursor. That's the uh, yep. And so you need to access like all the table info fields. Though we need like snapshot to be accessible. Well, actually, we only need like snapshot um, and key at that point. 
do we just then iterate until, or we just increment until we find something visual with the current snapshot? Um, and then if we've gone past the end key, then we're done. Yeah. Um, There's also something like maybe our iterator can't use get table index because actually the iterator doesn't want an exact match. It, it actually just wants the, the first thing that's greater than or equal to. Right. Um, so probably like, yeah. so, so get table, um, that's going to say get table index and it's going to pass key for key min and key again for key max. And then direction doesn't matter. So it can just pass ascending. And that'll get the index of the first table that matches that key, which will, which will satisfy the point lookup. Hmm. Yeah. I think get table should have this API though, like externally. Yeah, yeah. Internally, it's like no, in the air how it gets implemented though. Yeah, um, but, but here we like like let's have a get table index function, and that that actually takes in key min and key max and direction. Uh, okay, and this returns potentially a table that does not contain key. Min. Exactly. It's 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 best. Um, it's going to find the first table, um, so we we can give it a key min and a key max, and a direction, and it's going to find the first table that is, which has a min key, like basically the basically the first table that could contain what we're looking for. I need to just take a key direction. in a direction. I don't think it needs a key max. I think the iterator should worry about the key max part. What do you think about uh, that? Um, uh, yeah, then it gets back to where we, 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 I, we, yeah, we could, but, but then it almost doesn't need it. I don't know. Okay. Yeah. Let's I think do that. that. Nicer. Let's, yeah. Nice. Yeah. It's actually, yeah. So this then becomes, whoops, way down there, I've messed up a comma. Um, so get table, now we like, um, I'm gonna call it index for now. I feel like it's wrong to have a type that's not correct. Call it index and we'll fix that later. Um, get table internal, um, we'll now return an optional index. This won't turn an optional, this will always return an index. That won't be optional. Um, now it might, need it, to check it if, might return it might return optional if you um get to the beginning or the end of the array um, okay so this could return an optional index so then we have an or else return null here just barely fits in our 100 columns it's 99 columns perfect yeah, we, we, <laughs> we just need to add um direction <laughs> Oh, <laughs> darn it, no. <laughs> well, we don't care about direction, actually, but yeah. Um, it doesn't matter what direction something. we pass here. Ex exactly. Um, and then we can just wrap that, I guess. It looks kind of funky, though. Um, it's, it's okay. Oh, look just at this. Close our eyes. It's yeah. now. That doesn't fit still, though, does it? Uh -uh. And then a do like this. I I like prefer this though if we do it on multiple lines. Yeah. Okay, that's, that's under hundred now. Yeah. Cool. I don't like. Yeah. I just don't like um indents like this without curly braces around them. It yeah. seems weird to me. Yeah. Me too. Cool. So now we need to check, we need to like say Another, manifest that get. I don't know if, info. if, yeah, uh, just to, on that line link thing, I don't know if it helps us, but we could do, we, uh, I read something once where people were saying, like in Java, you have getters and setters and the getters always start with get. Um, but if it's a getter, you can actually just drop the get prefix. Uh, we could basically just have yeah, manifest yeah. table, table index. 
Um, that's also cool. I don't know, and then yeah, it probably will like find for lunch. Just automatically did for table info. <laughs> exactly. So maybe table index, we just drop the get, what are those get get prefixes, and we. Sure. What about for table? That's cool too. Are we in our under a hundred? Well. Oh, if we like get rid of that now, um, mm. still 104. Okay, but I still I think it's nice manifest table index. It's it, it's pretty cool like that. Um, hey, you know what we could do? Just use I. We don't have to say index here. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 you really no, want to get this under 100? Not not in the no, exactly name. 100. The, no, 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 uh, not in the function name. It oh, has to be in the function name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, there we go. But now the function, right. <laughs> but the function name must must be in full. Like, uh, cool. One hundred exactly. Yeah. <laughs> nice work. Are you happy with right. the high like that? Um, yeah, I'm fine with it. It doesn't matter to me here. It's a, it's, a, it's like a three line function probably. There, I'm yeah. happy with one letter variable names. Um, yeah. But, yeah, to everybody who's watching this, this is what we do all day long. Like we, we work on names <laughs> and line, names are line important, links though. of names. Yeah. It's, a good, way, it's like, good, like a little small break from the hard parts. Um, yeah, yeah. So now we, we want to like return we now need to check if the key is actually present inside this table. So we have here const info equals that. We now need to say if compare keys um, key info dot key min. Um, or we've done ascending. And so this will either return, um, actually, we want to compare with, yeah, it's with, it's with key min. So we want to compare if our key is, ac is actually greater than key min. Um, No, actually, we less, greater than or equal to key min. If it's equal to key min, that's fine. If it's less than key min, and we've returned a table past the or outside where our key is not included. Um, yeah, we, so, we basically want to compare the key against key min of the table and key max. Yep. Because we don't need to um, we don't need to compare with key max because we've done ascending here. Um, Because um, so, this is if, this is what we'll if, use for a we, we want to return a table that could contain the key. Right. But so we know if, that this table index that return is returned here. If it returns one, it'll return one that is either um, contains the key or is larger. Or all the indexes in the table are larger than the key because we're going in ascending yeah. order. And so we only need to check against key min. Yeah, that's good for compaction, but for this one, we actually, because table, it, it's going to go, yeah, so, okay, I, I'm still understanding. Let me understand some more. Oh, you, you keep going. Okay. So, if the key is less than key min, That means the key is not inside the table, so we want to return null. Yeah. Otherwise, return info. And we could just assert that the um, just just to start exactly. with, like, That's the right assert, right? Yeah. Um, it could be less than or equal to. Yep, you're right. So it's not equal to not greater than. Greater than, yeah. But I think we want to, oh, do we want to do it there even? Yeah, we can do it there already, so we might as well. Um, yeah, of course. Yeah. Cool.
And then maybe we can do that return null as a one liner on the sure. compare keys. Yeah. We could also flip this around, but I'm not sure we should. We could do the same comparison here, but with a different key instead of the key min instead and here return info. Here return null. I'm not sure if that's better though. We can use the same comparison yeah. we assert in this. I think so. Then, it's nicer actually to say like if it's exactly what we're thinking, return it. Because otherwise we, we default to returning the info. Yeah. I think it's better to, to do this like this, yeah. Um but I'm gonna actually add a new line here as well. I think we're good. Yeah, I was, I was thinking um, that too. So if cool. the key is less than Oh, I think we've got a bug. Or equal. Uh, yeah. yeah, if the really? key is less than or equal to key min, we're going to return the table info. That seems wrong, yeah. So what have I, what have I done wrong here? Have I flipped key min and key max? Um, yeah. It should actually be greater than or equal to. It should be not equal to less than. Um, if the key is yeah. greater than or equal to key min, then return. Yeah. And there we go. If the key is less than less than or equal to key max, or assert that the key is less than or equal to key max. Yep. That makes sense yeah. because then we're we're ascending order. And okay. we if it's greater than or equal to key min, then the key is inside the table we got returned, then we can return info. Otherwise, yeah. we return null. It's now good, I think. Cool. Hey, nice. We're I'm making glad we head like, Yeah, we're making headway. We're writing code again. It feels good. Yeah. We're not just like discussing yeah. <laughs> design. Yeah, it's tough. Eh? Uh, like, well done. Like the your idea for having just a single key to table index, not key min, key max. Thanks for convincing me. Uh, I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll think it we'll, we'll have it. Uh, elsewhere we'll have it yeah. like for table index we don't exactly is, that's all we need yeah for the iterator we, we will use it for the iterator input because then we need like the yeah. end but for this table yeah. index we don't um yeah so this is then to do this is like uh, we need to know the manifest data layout for that but we can implement yeah. iterator now on top of this these two things or on top of table index now yeah. um and table infos oh, this is also to do because i probably write that one out oh. too um cool by, by the way, uh, Prodi uh, posted a picture of his swag that's arrived, and he says, "I am oh, now nice. one with the with the tiger beetle." Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. Uh, so we, we <laughs> I replied I replied and I said uh, TPS is now through the roof. Uh, <laughs> so nice. Yeah, and All right. Slim, so now you Slim take it also, which is just. Yeah, he was also tweeting out our stream stuff, like the the Kway merge that it's also directed on that. So it was pretty cool. Thanks, thanks, Slipsack. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Do you think we've earned a lunch break? Uh, maybe. Um, probably. Well, when do we have the Tiger Wheel sync today? Is that like? Four o'clock. Yeah. Uh, three o'clock your Four time. Four o'clock. Okay. Three o'clock my time. Yeah. We do a lunch break. Um. Sure, and then just come back and finish up the stuff we know how to implement now and see if we run into any design or think of any showstoppers over lunch. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. We actually, we, we it's, um, I, I've got to head off at like 10 to, th 10 to 2 your time quickly just okay. to get home and then head back. So maybe okay, we've, so that's we've in like half an hour already. You're like 40 yeah. minutes. But yeah. So may, maybe this is a good place to, um, what do you think? Shall we call it a day for today? Call it a day for the stream or just call it a day for today. Yeah. And then I'll see you at the Tiger Wheel yeah. sync later. Yeah. Um, yeah we'll catch up later. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, nice work today. Um, yeah. Anybody the author is still watching. I hope you enjoyed the stream. Um, I had a lot of fun. Um, it's cool to share like what we've been working on pretty intensively for the past um, months with an audience that's interested. Um, yeah. Yeah.
Yeah, it's awesome. We, we've got um, four four viewers live, so that's pretty cool. Like, kudos to everybody in the States, like, staying up. Like, Slim Sag was, like, 4 a.m. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah. So, awesome, cool. awesome. It's been nice. And I, I'm tough. Yeah. Like, we had, like, a pretty tricky part, like, to get this table index stuff yeah um, i feel like we're making headway though there's still there's still yeah. questions to answer for sure but we're making headway yeah the nipsey just says uh enjoyed the stream would love to see this more often so cool um, i guess we should do this again like next week sometime maybe um yeah yeah we'll, figure we'll it out. yeah we'll let you know like we'll probably we'll probably be back on monday or tuesday um i just need to because we might have a function here on Monday, but I, I'm not sure yet. So I'll, I'll, we'll let everybody know. See if we've got uh, your streaming head covers free for the day. <laughs> yeah. And I, Isaac, how do you feel? Like, are we going to like do this every day? Um, I mean, we could, it's not really that much effort if we just, yeah, yeah. just, start, it's just pretty much starting up the stream and then doing our normal work. And so we yeah. might as well, I think it'd be fun. Um, cool. people can so come we... out, watch some code. <laughs> Yeah, um, come hang out at the virtual office and we'll be here and uh, anytime, like, yeah. Cool. Awesome. Yeah, so right. signing off uh, Tiger Beetle Sessions, Friday, 10th December, Session 1. Awesome work, Isaac. Catch you, catch you next you time. Too, Bye. Bye.